Recording in progress. Good. Okay. It is uh, six o'clock PM on August 16th, 2021. Call the, we're going to call this meeting to order per ORS 192.610 to 192.690 and ORS 192.650. This meeting is being recorded. Um, also the video recording of this meeting will be placed on the Clack Clackamas Fire website. So Chief Brown, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, Mr. President, there are no changes to the agenda. Okay, let's talk about the, uh, <clears throat> the meeting minutes of our last meeting in July. Anybody have any comments about our minutes from last meeting? Um, okay, any changes or anything that we need to make to the meeting, the minutes from last session? I'm seeing a lot of head shaking, so good. That's great. I, I uh, so we can, uh, we can approve the minutes as written. Uh, we're up to public comment already. Um, Rachel, was there anybody that uh, wanted to uh, talk tonight for their three minutes? I didn't receive anything prior to the meeting. Um, so unless someone has something and you would like to give an opportunity to raise their hand during the meeting, I didn't receive any notice ahead of time. All right, we have some folks in attendance. Uh, does anybody in attendance uh, want to uh, uh, talk to the board at all tonight? We'll give you guys a few seconds to find your hand raise just to make sure. Okay, uh, it does not look like we are there. All right, everybody, we have, we're moved up to the Civil Service Commission interview. We have a gentleman, Michael Daly, um, that has applied for the uh, open spot on the Civil Service Commission. So uh, I trust everybody has their uh, packet for uh, <clears throat> Dr. Daly in front of them. And uh, had an opportunity to read that um, um, little bio that he put in there. Um, so I want to make sure everybody is ready to proceed with talking to Dr. Daly. Um, Everybody ready to do that? You know, uh, board members, I think if it's okay with you, since we are doing this by teleconference, we'll just kind of do it like we've done it before. I'll just ask the questions and uh, we'll let Dr. Daly uh, uh, answer them. And then when everybody's ready, we'll just move on to the next question. Does that sound like a good idea? Okay, we got a lot of shaking of the head, so we'll go with that. Well, uh, Dr. Daly, welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, the, our board meeting, and I want to thank you for applying for the Civil Service Commission. This is, a, as you know, a very important uh, position in our fire district, and so uh, um, I want to thank you for that, but uh, uh, we want to move forward and just talk to you a little bit. Um, and we did get your, uh, we do have in our packet, we do have the uh, um, the little bio that you put in there and the and the uh uh why you expressed interest of being on the on the commission but uh um just kind of those generic questions tell us a little bit we'd like to hear from you about uh yourself and uh and your interest in serving in the civil service commission well first of all uh unless you're talking to me about your cough or your hernia you don't have to refer to me as doctor. You can call me Michael, Mike, or hey, you. I even respond to uh, other lower calls too. So Michael is good. Uh, I'm very interested in the prevention of fires. I live in a fire prone area myself at the outermost limits of Clackamas, not the outermost limits, but well in the rural area of Clackamas. Uh, I'm surrounded by 20 acre and one acre farms uh, and a lot of forestry there. So in addition, I have been touched distinctly by the fire in that I had to evacuate with my family uh, with the last uh, big fire last year, just another cross to bear in that the year of infamy, uh, 2020. Uh, so it's been very close to me. I. Yeah, luckily, my wife and I uh, took the Citizens Fire Academy course uh, in the prior year to that, uh, promoted by Glenn Ahrens at OSU. 
So we were pre prepared for such an eventuality that did occur. Uh, and I just was able to really appreciate the value of the course uh, at that time. As I noted in my uh, bio, so to speak, I have a strong family tradition of firefighting. Uh, I'm proud to say that my father was a deputy chief of the San Francisco Fire Department back in the 70s. Uh, and uh, he uh, was followed by my brother who was also a fireman and was in the arson squad for years. Uh, two uncles uh, were in the fire department and uh, they are still, uh, at least one of them is not my uncle, but at least one of my relatives is still in the fire department in Chicago. That is my son who is a paramedic in the fire department. So uh, in, the, in essence, I have a strong family history of involvement with the fire department and most recently my own exposure to fire in this area has made me more, very aware of the importance of firefighting. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, the second uh, question we have for you is, can you summarize for us your understanding of the primary roles and responsibilities of the Civil Service Commission? That is a good question. I was able to attend the last meeting and it seemed to uh, include quite an array of subject matter, uh, ranging from amalgamation of districts to uh, uh, payments or salary uh, advancement for different firemen. Uh, I don't know how far the, uh, the agenda could have gone or if that agenda was limited. It didn't seem limited at the time of the meeting, but it covered a wide variety of subjects, uh, some of which I was not acquainted with. And so I would have to plead ignorance on uh, quite a few of the items that uh, were raised. Uh, but I'm a quick learner too. So I'm not intimidated by the subject matter. I just have to be acquainted with it and more thoroughly than I had with that brief exposure at the last meeting. Okay, well, fair enough. Well, we've got some awesome people on our civil service commission. So I have no doubt that uh, they will bring you, they could bring you up to speed uh, very quickly. So, um, okay. Um, well, I think you kind of answered the next one, but I'm going to throw it out there anymore was what experience, skills, and abilities do you have that would support your role as commissioner? So you kind of answered some of that stuff in the first go around, but uh, is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, I think just my general education uh, really comes in handy, uh, postgraduate work and uh, graduate work uh, made me a critical thinker. I don't have to be led by the hand for the most part. I'm an independent thinker, uh, sometimes stubborn, stubborn too, but uh, I'm not uh, a blank slate. I do have my biases and opinions, but I'm welcome and open to uh, being convinced of the error of my ways for different subjects, but uh, it's pretty uh, non, uh, not committal, but not uh, a point of contention that we need a vibrant uh, and intelligent uh, commissioner. And hopefully I can meet that, those standards. Okay, um, okay, Michael, well, thank you. Uh, lastly, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us that, uh, that you haven't so far? No, I think, uh, I think we covered the waterfront. Uh, I, I, I just wanna add that I'm both, uh, proud and honored to be considered for this uh, position. It is uh, an important one and I would hope to do my uh, utmost to fulfill the, uh, the aims of the uh, commission. Well, thank you for that, Michael. Um, well, that pretty much concludes the interview um, that we have. Does any, uh, any directors want to uh, talk to uh, Michael about anything or ask any further questions or any comments or anything? Come on, Thomas, I know you better than that. <laughs> hey, Jay, I was, I was trying to be quiet. <laughs> Michael, you know, I, I, I truly appreciate 
your willingness to volunteer, a person of your caliber can be very useful for us and we need our continuous input. So we thank you on behalf of the board for volunteering and to commit your time for the community and the fire district. Thank you. Any other directors? I, I, I would just like to also uh, thank Dr. Daly for stepping up to volunteer for this position. I feel a little personally responsible that it's open since I managed to win an election and left it vacant. So I, I appreciate you stepping up uh, so that the board isn't left minus a member on my account for too long. Could I ask a favor of you folks? Uh, I saw some of you at the last meeting, but I didn't uh, recognize some of the present uh, attendees. Uh, at least I didn't have the same number of, of pictures in front of me. I had about five pictures then, and now I see quite a few. I would appreciate it if you could introduce yourselves and tell me your position or uh, title or what have you that distinguishes you. Thomas, for example, you're up the upper left corner of my screen. Could you tell me what, who you are and what you do? Michael, I am a board of director for the Clackamas Fire. I've been on the board since um, 2011. Okay, cool. Hi, Michael, I'm Jim Searing and I'm also a director. I've been on the board for six years. Previous to that, I worked for Clackamas Fire and retired after 30 years. Okay, thank you. Michael, um, I'm Marilyn Wall and I am um, on the board of directors as well. And I was initially appointed in 1999. Thank you, Marilyn. Michael, I'm Chris Oz. I'm uh, the newest member of the board. I, I have been here for a whopping one month. <laughs> I, uh, I sat in my first official meeting last month. I've, I've sort of been hanging around the fire department for a number of years, uh, mostly because they let me ride in a fire engine once in a while. <laughs> well, you're senior to me, aren't you? <laughs> Michael, I'm Jay Cross. Um, I've been on the board since uh, 2013. And prior to that, I was with the Boring Fire District Board. And I've worked for Gresham Fire Department for 29 years. So I've been a paramedic for a little more than that for 34 years, so um, so yeah, that's, I'm still not retired yet, like so many of the other folks on the board, but. Thank you. Anybody else that you're curious about? I think Nick, you are. Yeah, I was, I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself, Thomas. <laughs> I'm uh, Nick Brown. I'm the, the fire chief for Clackamas Fire. Uh, started May 1st. So um, I've got I've got three months in as the fire chief. And thank you so much uh, for coming here and and your willingness to to help make the fire district better. Uh, Michael, we really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, um, action-wise, do we need to um, make a motion and second and vote uh, vote for Michael for the this position? Is that what we need to do now, or does I think it's it one in? of our agenda items? It's before. Oh, yeah. okay. Before what? That's funny. Funny. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we'll wait. Till, we'll wait till we get down there. Then we'll just keep moving on. Okay, um, perfect. Uh, Michael, thank you. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll be down to um, where we uh, vote on that in our action items. So, uh, next up for our business item is Emergency Manager Greg Ramirez to talk to us about Emergency Preparedness Month. Good evening, Mr. President. Members of the board, have a short presentation. If we could bring that up, Rachel, please. Fantastic. Well, I, uh, I love the uh, way Dr. Daly uh, 
to find the last year, 2020, as a um, in, in infamous year, it definitely was. And I'm glad that he also pointed out uh, that the some of the training that he received uh, helped prepare his family for uh, for just such a disaster. So that's what we're talking about tonight: is uh, generally being prepared for those disasters. And uh, but most specifically about bugging out, knowing when, knowing how, knowing why, and just having some, uh, you know, well, let's go to the next slide. We'll discuss it. So 2020 did, did hand us a handful of, of an array of different things. Uh, and again, I, I can't think of a better way to describe it than Dr. Daly did. And of course, the wildfires created a, a situation where so many people had to evacuate their homes, some with only moments notice. And what, what we found, particularly those of us that were taking a lot of the calls, uh, is people having questions with regard to uh, what does it mean? What do the different evacuation levels mean? Um, I, up until that point, I thought we had done a pretty good job of, of really evangelizing the ready, set, go uh, mnemonic. I really thought we had done a, a better job of making people aware of the different resources that are available. But um, we found that there's a lot of work to do in that area. So. Uh, tonight, we're going to discuss that that and what we can do for ourselves and, and the message we can take to our communities. Next slide, please. So it all starts with planning. Uh, and everything, everything has to start with a good plan. And when it comes to preparing for evacuation, when it comes to preparing your family for relocating when it's necessary, there's a number of things that you need to take into account. You need to talk about meeting places in case uh, your home family members aren't able to get back to, the, to their uh, home base. You need to have those secondary uh, places where, where families can meet. You need, need to have a plan for your pets and livestock. We, we found that in the last couple of disasters to be a, a huge issue. Uh, people needing to move livestock, uh, they need means and they need the location to go to. And it's good to have those things thought through ahead of time. Uh, a lot of people have pets, of course, and there's a lot of considerations that need to go along with their medications, their food, uh, finding a, a shelter that will take pets. So a lot of things that need to be considered ahead of time. A communication plan, including an out-of-state contact so that your family can uh, communicate after a disaster and start, start uh, uh, just that process of, of, of uh, reunifying and getting everybody back together. Uh, you need to know what to take and have those plans ahead of time. There's everything from those critical and vital things to those uh, family heirlooms, pictures, things of that nature you might want to take. So ahead of time, it's, it's good to talk about it, think about it, and even practice it. Uh, special needs, you have people in your family that have medications, that have um, hearing, hearing aids, things of that nature. Those types of things you need to have um, a redundancy of and you need to be prepared to make sure that when you evacuate, uh, you take those those items that support people with uh, special needs, and then here's an, here's one that's been a big subject: is evacuation routes. Um, we're finding that uh, the primary evacuation routes can get pretty pretty congested, so you need to plan with your family, get a map out, and decide some secondary ways to get out of your community when it becomes necessary. Next slide, please. One of the most important things that we can all do and remind our friends and family and neighbors to do is to sign up for public alerts. It was incredible to us, the number of people that had never heard of this, this program. It's simple, it's free, it's fast, it's easy. Heck, I did it, so it's not that difficult. And um, just <clears throat> it'll, it'll afford you some valuable information, timely information, and um, it just really helps you stay on top of what's going on in your community and, and helps you be aware of, of uh, you won't be in the dark if you do this. And so again, I, I encourage each one of us, if we haven't done it, uh, to make sure that you do and then to pass this message along to your friends, family and neighbors. Next slide, please. So let's talk about evacuating. We talk about it in terms of ready, set, go. And you'll hear level one, level two and level three, they're corresponding. Level one is that ready state, that ready state of where you've done your planning, you've done your, your packing, and you're ready at, at a moment's notice, and you're ready to continually monitor uh, social media, uh, web, our website, and then public alerts, and just 
really being aware and educated as to what you need to do for your family. And that set, set is, is really leaning forward into it. That, that means you might start packing your vehicle, making sure you have a full tank of gas. It might mean that you start to initiate the planning that, you, that you've already rehearsed about you know, what pictures, family heirlooms, uh, things of importance, prescriptions. That's really the time when you're leaning forward and you're not gonna scramble at the last minute when, when you get the, the level three, which is go. Level three, go is not a time to be wondering, worrying, deciding. It is just go. It is absolutely the time when you just need to move out and go and enact the plans that you've got in place. Next slide, please. So here's a go bag when you're called to bug out of your home. You've heard me talk about 72 hour kits, two week preparedness. While that's all important, there's some simple things that you might need to take. And basically it's just a bag that's, it's an overnight bag, but it's more like a three night overnight bag. Uh, those type, those things that you'll need to be uh, the creature comforts you might need to support you if you're going to be out of your house for an extended period of time. So it's and quite honestly, I'm not asking people to spend a lot of money. Uh, the things that I didn't find around my house, the other items, most of them were purchased at the dollar store. So an old gym bag and a pair of sweats and no pair of shoes and, and some toiletries and, and your medications, you'll, you'll be, you'll be more comfortable. You'll be more resilient to disaster. And it, again, it's, Fast, fast, easy, and inexpensive to, to put a kit together. Something you can do over a weekend with your family, just talk that process through. And again, don't forget to pack something for your pets as well because some many shelters now take pets, but they won't have those wraparound services for your pets. They won't have your pet's food. They won't have your pet's medications, those types of things. So you'll be, need to be pre prepared for that. So that is bug out and how to be ready for a bug out. It all starts with planning. And it's vitally important, as we saw this last year, with everything it handed to us, that uh, we could be called on in a moment's notice to evacuate our homes. And when you get that go message, then is not the time to be deciding what you need to pack and go with you. I would love to answer any questions you might have or any uh, additional information you, you have that uh, suggestions you might have for us. Happy to entertain that. Yeah, Greg, I got a couple questions. Um, sure. During the Eagle Creek fire um, a couple of years ago, we made our place available for um, farm animals. And we did have three families take us up on that from the Corbett area and we housed it up. Last year, obviously we were level two all of last year, so we couldn't make that available. But is there a place that we can you know, let know, register in Clackamas County or whomever with that, to let them know that our property is available as long as we're not in level two at the time? That's fantastic, uh, President Cross. <clears throat> That's a great point. Um, what I'm doing right now is we're collecting a very extensive list of uh, vendors, people with resources. Uh, one of the things I want to do is have a registry of, of places where people can take large animals. Uh, so I'm not aware of a, and I don't believe there is a uh, formalized county registry, but uh, definitely collecting that information now. So I'll be reaching out to you for uh, your information. Um, it has been amazing the number of people that have offered their properties, um, particularly in this wildfire, that were able, able and willing to, to accept large animals. It was amazing. So, um, but as you know, moving large animals isn't just having a place to go. They need to have a, a conveyance and means to get there. So we're, I, think, I think there's, there's money to be made there in, in talking with the public about particularly thinking through that process of how they're going to move their livestock and where they're going to take them. Well, yeah, our experience with the folks from Corbett area was uh, they had the ability to move it. They just needed a place to move them to. Uh, and then they obviously came out every day and took care of their own animals. All we had to do was keep them but find a fence, which was easy. So um, that's that wasn't an issue. I just didn't know if there was some sort of a cachet or a, an information uh, sharing group for stuff like that uh, other than word of mouth, because that's exactly the way we found it. But yeah, if, uh, yeah, I'd certainly be uh, willing to share that with you uh, later. The other question I have for you is the, uh, the alert system, the Clackamas County alert system. Uh, where do we go? What do we do to get to uh, make sure that we're on that? I'll just Google public alerts Clackamas County, and it'll walk you through the process. Like I said, it took me five minutes, and it's totally free. Okay. And I get everything from the uh, extreme weather alerts to amber reports, 
And not some, I mean, it happens infrequently. It's, it's really those sentinel events that uh, they, they'll chime you for. So it's not something that's gonna clog up your email or have your phone ringing off the hook. So when, you, when I get a notice, it's something, it's something important. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, any other questions for uh, for Greg? Yeah, Marilyn. Um, yeah, Greg. Since you're talking about the Clamus County Public Alert System, I thought I was signed up, and I'm interested that you said there is supposed to be a weather one because, despite the fact that I live in Milwaukee area and have a Milwaukee zip code, I only received a, an extreme weather warning from Multnomah County. And so I, I wondered if there's limits on what Clackamas County does, or maybe I need to re-register or something. You know, Marilyn, I, I've got the same question. I, I, it, it just occurred to me as you were saying that the extreme weather warning I got was Multnomah County. Multnomah County, yeah. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know what, I need to find out that answer because as you were saying it, it occurred to me, I didn't get one from Clackamas County, I got it from Multnomah County. I'll find out that answer. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments for Greg? Perfect, okay, cool. Thank you, Greg, thank you for that information. It's always very informative. So uh, um, the next thing um, on our agenda is B1, which is the Acrest, Acrest request board approval for proclamation 21 um, dash 03 to designate the month of September as emergency pregnant preparedness month with the theme, be ready to bug out. Once again, I didn't say any of that very well, but um, you can read it yourself. <laughs> um, so anybody have any comments or uh, anybody had a chance to read the proclamation and um, any comments about that? Greg, anything you wanna to talk to us about the proclamation? No, just that I ask uh, the board to please adopt and proclaim September's National Preparedness Month. And like you said, our theme is be ready to bug out. And I asked, I'm asking us to be role models um, for our friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, that uh, we kind of take that message and, and we share it because uh, we've, we found out so many people this, this, last, this last big fire event um, weren't prepared. They weren't prepared to know where, where to get the information. And they certainly were, weren't prepared to bug out in short order. So I think it's our responsibility to be good role models in that regard. OK, um, great. I would move the board uh, approve proclamation 21-03 to designate the month of September 2021 as emergency preparedness month with the theme, be ready to bug out. Second. Um, had a, a motion and a second. Um, any discussion, any more discussion? I know that Michael, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yes, I just want to say uh, I belong to Serve Or, which is an emergency medical uh, response for the state of Oregon. And they have the same principle that Greg mentioned is that they have a go bag list that they provide to all the volunteers for essential uh, material that they should have on hand when, before they're called for an emergency. I wonder if such a list for evacuation that Greg listed or he had, the, had the picture of all the necessary uh, material there. I was wondering if there was a list listing it that we could publicize and give to the public. There is Dr. Bailey, I, I did a short presentation here a few weeks ago, uh, Chief Brown has asked that we all be ready to be self-sufficient for, for 72 hours. And that list contained everything that should go on a go back. So I can make sure you get that. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? And uh, looks like no. So Rachel, call the roll, please. Absolutely. Thomas Joseph? Yes. Marilyn Wall? Yes. Jim Searing? Yes. Chris Hawes? Yes. Jay Cross? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, everybody. Nice job, Greg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Okay. Uh, B2, request board approval to authorize a, the fire chief to enter into a contract for a feasibility study in cooperation with Sandy Fire District number 72, Chief Carlson and Chief Yerke. What do you got for us? 
Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, yes, you have that request before you. And I thought <clears throat> what would be nice is just to give a little background on what we've done and how we got here and report out on um, what our process has been like. So as you know, uh, we put out for an RFP, RFQ a month, about a month's time that ended in Ju on July 19th. We ended up with three consultants that gave us proposals. Um, that was AP Triton, uh, Public Consulting Group, and Matrix. Once we got those three uh, proposals, we got together to do our scoring and review. And that process was a two-phase process where each of the consultants came in and did a presentation of their proposal uh, before our um, interagency committee and staff members. And then we had uh, a job form. We scored them on a pass-fail basis and then went into the afternoon based on those proposals and, and their presentation and scored them again in the afternoon and came up with our final recommendation, which was primarily based on <clears throat> uh, AP Triton and their, uh, their team approach. They were concise and followed um, our, our scope of work to a T uh, and their price point. And so that was... Uh, that was not unanimous uh, decision. That was, uh, um, you know, not everybody landed on AP Triton, but that was the majority. And we had healthy debate on that topic. Uh, and ultimately that's where we landed. So um, I feel confident in this recommendation that we move forward with uh, AP Triton and um, what they have proposed and would like to, to recommend that we that we approve that and enter into negotiations and a, ultimately a contract with AP Triton. I know that uh, the other board members involved would probably like to at least share their thoughts and or um, their experience though. So I'd, I'd like to open it up and if either of the, the board members would like to speak to give them that opportunity. Um, as I understand it, uh, Sandy's board voted already five to zero uh so that's a good thing yep uh the uh the, the price is under budget that's a good thing um i just wanted to say that josh and mike the two chief officers you and the committee that worked on this i thought you did a great job in the process it was very organized and presented nicely uh the this whole process from beginning to end with Sandy. I mean, a lot of us went through the boring. We had to get a study and then it led to something. And then with S. Cicada, had to get the study and led to something. Even those were quite the processes. This one seems a little different. The Sandy chief's team and their directors, are very collaborative, very positive, open. Uh, it's a great collaborative kind of a spirit and partnership and it just seems different which i'm very appreciative of so those are just my comments ultimately because uh as some of you might know i actually started my own consulting business and llc i've been doing some fire department consulting work as if i don't have enough to do but uh i've been doing some work with uh, several companies out there so for, for that reason uh, all I'm really doing is just stating that I thought the process went good. All three of the proposals, they were all good. We could take any of them and they would do a good job. But ultimately, I was going to abstain from the vote just because I've been involved out in the consulting world. So I just wanted to make that statement. But turn over to Thomas. Okay. <clears throat> and the rest of the, the board members and stuff. Uh, I thought we had a very healthy discussion and this was unlike George mentioned this was not a unanimous choice but I think it is very important to have a discussion the pros and cons of the, all the uh, companies that we were in discussion with and finally this is the decision of the majority and that's what we are bringing forward. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. And I'd like to just uh, <clears throat> reiterate some other points that uh, um, Director Searing brought up. So the, the bid coming in uh, with a discount involved 
not including um, review of our facilities and apparatus at Clackamas Fire because that has been done so recently. So <clears throat> that was something that was specific within the scope of our work. And so that was, uh, that was noted for sure. And just to add on to what Director Joseph had mentioned is really the two standouts were PCG and AP Triton. And at the end of the day, the price point with AP Triton um, brought the group to where we, where we are right now. So I'd be happy to answer any other questions anyone might have. Yeah, Chief Yerke, I do have a question. So um, the last feasibility study that we did, the information that we thought we were gonna get, the information we actually got was completely a little, a little bit different. So um, are we actually with this, do you feel confident that we're actually gonna get the information that we think we're gonna be getting this time? I do, and and thank you for that that question. I we we had very direct questions that we asked each of the consultants, and for this specifically, um, that was discussed. And what what was landed on was that this team and their team approach is going to be without predetermined outcomes. Obviously, that they were going to come forward with more than just a recommendation for consolidation. So I really do believe with their team approach and the way that they're, they're wanting to, and we are wanting to engage our stakeholders, which is a, uh, an extended list from the previous feasibility study, uh, that they, we will get what we want, which is an unbiased uh, approach to what we should be doing or shouldn't be doing moving forward as far as collaboration with Sandy Fire District number 72. Okay. I, I have to tell you, when we, I know we have to do feasibility studies, and I understand why we have to do feasibility studies, but I got to tell you what, after our last feasibility study, it gives me heart palpitations. So, um, uh, so I just want to put that out there. I want to make sure that we, we don't have to have Steve Peters spend the next six months recreating it like he did last time. So, um, okay. Any other directors have a question for these guys? Yes, Chris. I, I just have kind of one that I was curious mostly because it's one of my things is undefined acronyms. Your, your JOT form um, in, in my office, that could be job order tracking. It could be just on time delivery, or if I'm testing the machine, it's joint operational testing. <laughs> so want to tell me what that one is when we're in this context? Yes, and, and I'm glad you asked that too. And sorry for the for the undefined acronym. So uh, with everything that's going on in the world, uh, we decided that we were going to uh, do this via Zoom, just like this platform, and with not all of us in the same room. So the JOT form is just a, an electronic form for scoring that we use. That's a product that we use within the fire district that on the back end uh, produces an Excel and all the, the scoring so that we have it for our records. So that was just literally a scoring sheet, but in an electronic form. Thank you. No, nothing special. Sorry, it was nothing more than a form. <laughs> Just actually jot down notes type thing. So the true <laughs> definition. Good. Yeah. Any other directors have any questions? And uh, um, and or uh, did uh, Chief Carlson want to say anything? I'm not sure that Chief Carlson's in attendance. Oh, he's not. OK. Oh, Marilyn has her hand up. Oh. So I don't have a question, but I have some comments on this. I um, totally respect the work that uh, Vice President Joseph and Director Searing and Chief Yerke and Chief Carlson and the supporting staff um, engaged in, as well as the uh, proposers. But um, I'm going to propose this for the same reason I've said before, and that is this is absolutely, in my opinion, premature. We've been six weeks, six weeks into our contract with Sandy. And now we're doing an analysis, one of the tasks that is set out in the proposal thing to determine how successful a six week arrangement has been. And I don't find that that is an appropriate time to do. Second, on those um, agencies that we moved forward to at a slower pace, got to know them, learn the ropes, found out what we wanted. We later on, after then doing a study, had a successful merger, unlike the Estacada one, which is like this, rushed through, and we didn't get time to, to wet our feet in the 
district and find out what they wanted and what they needed. And um, instead, we ended up with a failure at that junction. So despite the best pitch that Chief Brown gave me, um, I'm not um, gonna be able to support this because it's premature and that is the reason. I don't have any objection to um, the selected provider. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. Marilyn, uh, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. By the failure, what happened with the Estacada, we had an extensive discussion. That's one of the reasons we had a dis disagreement about the consultant selection. The consultant selection that we did not select has extensive proposal for marketing within the community, the stakeholders, and they will get the community involved and their input before we make a, any, they make any recommendation. That was not in the original discussion of the AP Triton, but since then, we, after the discussion, because of the budget matter, uh, we were, uh, Jim and the, our, the other board members from Sandy, we have had a very, very detailed discussion how important the input from the community, the participation from the community of particularly Sandy, uh, they, I don't want to rush through and make them believe that we are just coming and taking over. One of the things that they mentioned was, the, and actually it was from the PCG mentioned, how identity of a small community is important to the community. To go and have a merger or annexation of that sort can be detrimental to the community's best interest. And that's why Jim and I, very explicitly have requested to have detailed uh, input of the stakeholders and participation. It's not just for the benefit of the firefighters or the staff to join Clackamas Fire. This is to benefit the community. That was very important to me. And, and Jim has specifically mentioned in that contract negotiation with the Triton that they will have to follow some of the recommendation that PCG had, which was not in the original recommendation of the AP Triton. And they didn't have the expertise for that. And that was very important to me. And we made a very serious discussion and that was included in the um, RFP. I mean, amendment to the RFP, the the study uh, the stakeholders input and their opinion matters. Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate that. Chris, Jace, you are muted. Yeah, I'm muted. Chris, go ahead. I, I guess Marilyn touched on kind of where I was going to go with my next question because I didn't get the pitch from Chief Brown and I uh, kind of being new to this, I guess, I was kind of curious myself because I, I, I know we started the contract for service July 1, I think, Sandy. I was just kind of, I was kind of curious why, I guess, why now um, and not six months from now. I, I know it's a two-year contract and you can't wait for the last minute and all that stuff, but there's six months and there's six weeks. So I was kind of curious of, of kind of why now. Jay, we don't have a contract for service. We have an IGA. We are not taking completely over just like what we did in Estacada. This is a certain segment of IGA. I don't have all the day. Jim or Nick, can you educate Chris on that? The uh, IGA we have with Sandy? Well, the, the chief would be able to better explain the length, but uh, we've been in IGAs with Sandy for several years now. So uh, piece by piece, uh, they we started with the service and then we added a service. Well, now it's stepped up to the point where we're offering or con contracting via an IGA command and control, which means sending an effective response force, which means sending, you know, if you, if you watch the active 911, multiple engines, 
going on every one of their fires, which is okay because they're paying for that. We're doing their training, we're doing their fleet now. So they're in our past history, that was always a trigger point when we're doing so much that it becomes sometimes inefficient and more complicated because we're getting so involved. So if Sandy is willing to do a feasibility study because our relationship has evolved quickly, uh, rightly so, then in our past, it's always been a good time to do a feasibility study just for that sole reason alone. It's become complicated. And if their board obviously voted 5-0 just a few nights ago, there's some willingness on their side. So I've always looked at it that, hey, if they're interested in, in looking and evaluating how are things going now, can we do more together? Uh, is there a future? And, the, you know, we always that leads into a whole nother discussion. But to me, this is really no different than any of the other 12 that we've done over our history. Most that were successful and uh, one that wasn't, but uh, just as far as in general, I think the chief, you could probably talk more about how many years we've actually been uh, doing services with Sandy via an IGA. It's been a couple, hasn't it? Yeah, yes. Well, that, um, yeah. That does Sorry. raise a little bit of a question, Jim. So did Sandy request doing this? Yeah, it, in our in our in the last IGA we signed with Sandy a year ago, it said that we would talk about doing a feasibility study by January 1st of 2021, which that was eight months ago. So we did. We talked about it and then it it was like, well, we're supposed to talk about doing a feasibility study. So then we said, well, okay, obviously we're going to need to do one. That's how it got put in this new budget year. So this discussion just didn't come out of the blue. This is this was put in the the con the IGA basically a year and a half ago, okay. if that makes sense. So it just seems like maybe it kind of popped up, but it's really been an ongoing discussion for quite some time. So, Chief, you. Yeah, Jim, you, uh, Director Searing, you articulated that very well. Um, this was uh, put into play uh, about 18 months ago when we started talking about uh, an, an I, any sort of IGA with Sandy Fire. Uh, we brought uh, the conversation back in, uh, I think, October or January, those two dates, right in that time frame uh, in our interagency meeting and uh, and discussed, is this something that, uh, that the elected officials would like to see us go forth and do? And Sandy Fire was was very, um, uh, very supportive of it, as as was Clackamas Fire and and our our uh, electeds. Yes. I've been involved in a couple of these. Oh, sorry. No, I've been no, involved in a couple of these, and this is the, the first one where I've, I've really kind of seen some really good collaborate. Not that there hasn't been collaboration in, in, on other sides, but it's a it's a real win win. And, and we're really looking at what's going to be best for the for the both both areas. And um, so that's that's really the, the the gist of it, Chris. It, it wasn't a spur of the moment. Hey, let's go do this. This has been talked about for about 18 months. But also, Chris, this was recommended by both the groups, not just yeah. one Sandy or Clackamas. It was a consensus by the group groups. And most importantly, Chris, this is not because recommended by the board and the staff. I, that's why I was emphasizing uh, about the stakeholders' input, the participation of the community at large. Okay. And if, if and I, I could, oh, sorry, just to add too, I think when I was mentioning the services that we're currently contracting via an IGA with Sandy, really the one that I didn't mention, which is the most important of all, is we just Correct. opened a joint station with Sandy July 1st. That is significant. That you don't see very often. It's only the third time in our history we ever did that. District 71 in Happy Valley did a joint station and then everyone knows we did the joint station with Boring. And we saw how complicated that was. All of a sudden, you have different contracts. You're in different unions. You have different start times. And it, it opened up all kinds of other issues and problems. Well, Sandy is contributing over half a million dollars to help us staff a station that's never been open before 24-7. That's significant. So to me, they, they are 
they are a partner that stepped up to a level that you don't see that often. So one and one last piece to this is um, and Thomas, this speaks to the to the public interaction. Uh, you, you brought this forward as far as involving um, the neighborhood associations, business alliance groups, and Chief Snyder took that and and ran with it. Uh, I think you brought that up in our in our in our March meeting um, at the town hall meeting that we had in Eagle Creek. Uh, there was multiple Sandy uh, members there who came up to me afterwards and very happy about moving and seeing what uh, a feasibility study was. So it's obvious that Chief Snyder is engaging his community and and um, and involve, involving his citizen group uh, with this. So uh, for, for, for a member of the public to come up to me out of the blue at a, at a Clackamas Fire Town Hall meeting to, to mention that, I just think it speaks volumes on what Sandy's doing on, on, on their end. I would agree. Chief Brown, can I add one, one thing to this? I know we're both. I would love it if you would add one thing to it. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, Director Wall, I really appreciate that you're uh, being outspoken about not wanting to recreate or re, uh, repeat what we did before in Estacada. And I, I agree 100%. The scope of work, we actually called that out completely to say that this is not something that we want to do again. We don't want to run into... Um, the issues that we had with the citizens uh, not being in line and or understanding what we're what we're doing. So um, that's something that we've spoke about. And I, I know Chief Brown and everyone else has also mentioned the increased stakeholder involvement. Um, but that's part of why AP Triton rose to the level that they did, because there was tremendous flexibility around engaging the stakeholders earlier um, and, and really their robust team uh, emphasis on that. So it, it, it wasn't, um, it, it was definitely spoke to. And so that is something that's on the forefront of all the consultants mind uh, and at least AP Triton as well. So I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, but it doesn't change my mind. Um, I, uh, using the guise of a series of IGAs to pretend that you're not doing certain things is, is just a guise. It's a form over substance thing. Talking about this issue doesn't make it performance. And that was the problem in Estacada. They didn't see the performance. And then when they got th this thing, then there was no knitting to that community so that they were willing to overlook or forgive what they saw as our shortcomings because we hadn't established ourselves on the ground. And you can have stakeholder meetings up the yin yang and it isn't gonna make any difference. It's the performance. And I think that, and it's how you get to know your community. And that's what's missing in uh, going forward with this at this time. Um, and we did have joint staffing, right, Jim? Previously with boring. And uh, we didn't do that for six weeks and then do a study. We did it for what, year, two years, three years out there. So I think that again, it's a premature um, doing this and that the, you know, how providing um, some of the services that we've been providing that they've been paying for is no different than what we provide for anybody else. It doesn't make Sandy unique to um, our needs. And I just think that this is premature and that we need to take a more measured pace and learn the Sandy community. It shouldn't be up to their fire chief to learn it for us. It should be up to our people to learn it. Thank you. Jay. Yes, Thomas. I had the same hesitation. In fact, I talked to Merlin about the same issue and concern. And that's when I took time to meet with the Chief Carl, uh, Chief Gurky and Chief Brown. I had spent extensive time asking why and what is the purpose of this feasibility study. And the amount of activity we have, for example, working with that station 18, uh, they have spent inordinate amount of time showing how that collaboration with Sandy at the station 18 saved our citizens life by quicker response. I don't have all the statistics. I don't retain all those uh, technicalities. Jim knows quite a bit, but uh, Chief Brown and 
Chief Gurki can explain. I, again, I was on the same uh, hesitancy early part of this year, but I did spend a considerable amount of time with uh, Chief Gurki and Chief Brown. Okay, wow. Um, any other discussion about this, you guys? Um, okay. Well, the action item that we have in front of us um, is to authorize the fire chief to enter into a contract for a feasibility study uh, in cooperation with Sandy Fire District number 72. Um, before I call for a vote for this, Chief Brown, is there anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, that the collaboration between Sandy Fire and Clackamas Fire has been extremely well. The elected officials that, that the board has chosen to be elected officials for these groups have collaborated and, and seen fit that this is the best course of direction that we go. Uh, there have been a lot of hours put into this up to this point. Um, I understand Marilyn's concerns, Director Wall's concerns, and, and uh, Director Wall, you and I have talked on the phone uh, multiple times about this, and I'm not pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to to put the, the front of these two IGAs to, to, to push anything through. I think what you have is you have a fire chief in Sandy Fire and you have a fire chief in Clackamas Fire that see benefit to both, um, to, to both fire districts. And what I also see is that you see two fire chiefs that wanna take a measured approach to this. This just so happens to be that next approach for us to take before we start rolling this out to our citizens and engaging the citizens to the next level. Um, we don't know what this is going to what, what this is going to say. Uh, we we both feel like we know what it's going to say, but this helps give us that background to then ne go engage the, the communities. And I, I'm not going to depend on Chief Snyder to to get to know the citizens of Sandy Fire on Clackamas Fire's behalf, just like he wouldn't expect that from me. Um, so I. I I think that that we've had a lot of good collaboration to this point, um, and and I wouldn't bring this forward to the board if I didn't think this was the right course of direction for Clackamas Fire to go in the next step in talking with Sandy Fire. Um, I, I wouldn't bring this forward if there wasn't a a win win benefit for Clackamas Fire as well as Sandy Fire. Thank you. Um, Chief Snyder is in the audience. And so is any of the directors would like to hear from Chief Snyder at all? Uh, Jim, you have a comment. Um, well, as I've already stated, I, I wouldn't be voting tonight to award anything to any individual contractor, but I, I would always vote to support doing a feasibility study if it made sense. And, and in this case, I think that it does. Sandy has, Sandy Fire has made some very significant decisions. They purposefully didn't replace a retired division chief position last year so that they could bring on our battalion chief coverage and you command and control. That's significant. Then they chose to, to fund over half a million dollars to join staff a station with us. That's very significant. So we have to look at it in their shoes. They're doing, they're making some very significant decisions uh, in involving a partnership and trusting us, all they're asking is to spend $25,000 and partner with us to maybe uh, look into it a little deeper and have some options for the future. There's nothing wrong with having options for the future. So that's the last thing I have to say. Well, I have to, you know, I honestly, I do agree with a lot with uh, what Marilyn said about the fact that, uh, you know, I understand the intentions of the, the, both fire districts are very good intentions, and I don't question that whatsoever. But I also do agree with Marilyn that uh, to some degree about uh, 
uh, at the end of the day, it's what the citizens think is what really, really matters. And uh, we've learned that. So I completely understand that. So you know, that's just my two cents. I uh, a lot here to think about. So, okay. Um, this is this is difficult because I I mean one I'm kind of new at this, so I'm I'm kind of having to get up to speed fast. And I have something I call my internal spidey sense. And when my spidey sense goes off, I worry. And one thing I've watched as I've watched this board is Maryland has really, really good spidey sense. Well, one of the things about a feasibility study, even though it's $51,000, it doesn't commit us to anything. It just, it's a study of, it's a, it's a feasibility study. That's it. That's really what it comes down to. It gives us information that we didn't have, hopefully, hopefully it will give us information that we didn't have before. Um, that's the intent of it. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably gonna come back and say, yeah, it's feasible. But um, at the end of the day, we wanna know, I think we need to a little bit, know a little bit more detail on that too. So um, we don't have to pay $51,000 to know that it's feasible. But uh, um, okay. Uh, if none of the directors want to hear from any of the chief officers from Sandy, then I think we're going to move forward on this action item. Okay. So, do I hear a motion to approve to authorize the fire chief to enter into a contract for a feasibility study in cooperation with Sandy Fire District number 72? I move that we authorize the ever... fire chief to get into a feasibility study with Sandy Fire, fire Districts to contract negotiation with AP Triton and the joint funding will be a total of $51,534. Do so I have a second on that? I'll second Thomas's motion. Chris Haas seconds it. Okay, Rachel, call the roll. Absolutely, Jim Searing. Uh, I abstain. Thank you. Thomas Joseph? Yes. Jay Cross? Yes. Chris Haas? I'm going to go against Marilyn Spidey since I may regret it, but yes. Marilyn Wall? You will, Chris. Yeah, no. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for the robust conversation. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, okay, next thing on the agenda, make sure I'm on the right page here, is uh, discussion on changing the meeting time to 5 p.m. Chief Yerke. Uh Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, I, I think we're going to continue our uh, spirited discussion on this next topic. And I think we did the same thing last month um, regarding the change to our meeting time. So uh, really tonight, what I'd like to do is, is hopefully paint uh, the entire picture for the board to, to make a decision on this topic. Uh, and in doing so, um, to paint that picture, we got to really uh, report back some of the things that you'd asked us to do, which is just uh, to reach out to our target audience, which is the members that attend our board meetings and ask the question. So of the individuals that responded uh, to the proposed change, all of them agreed on and or supported a change to the meeting time. Uh, we had one that uh, thought that it should be later, just one that thought it should be later. And in those, um, that polling, it was really just isolated to phone calls and emails, um, up to and including um, individual that spoke uh, directly to Director Joseph on this topic and what they what they shared was just that um, they were all open to a change and that if they needed to adjust their schedule that they would and so I think that's uh, that's profound um, I think in addition to just sharing that uh, the polling that we did supported it I'd like to just kind of give you my um, perspective and or share what I've observed and and that is this that the fire district's game has changed. And, and I say that in light of the last two years, let's say, and just watching how we engage with the public. 
um, it's changed on all fronts in that, that we're having extremely visceral conversations, extremely transparent conversations in town halls, Facebook live events, um, our social media venues, up to and including, um, you know, uh, engaging in, in really high level conversations on diversity, equity, and inclusion on platforms with, uh, you know, Facebook, we have 25,000 followers, uh, Instagram, we have 12,000. And we're really having this open public dialogue back and forth. And what's unique about that is that, that our board meetings all of a sudden have become the, um, the small minority of opportunity for members of the public to come forward with either questions about the business of the fire district and or concerns and really have any kind of dialogue. So uh, what I've observed is just a, a fire chief and a team that has gone out and really engaged the public on, on very heated issues and, and topics that matter to, the, to, the, to your constituents or our citizens and the, the folks that we have sworn an oath to protect as, as the fire chief references often. So I think that's important to point out. Uh, this proposed uh, time change in my mind too is that so many things about this job uh, are out of our control. And, and this is definitely one thing that we do have uh, control over and can adjust. And I guess I say that just to, to share that in the last year, several times after uh, the business day, on the way home, I've witnessed the fire chief, the ops chief responding to uh, um, significant events. And those significant events have required us to lean on our chief officers, uh, our staff in a different way than we have in the past. Um, so the game has changed on that front as well. We are not getting slower. Um, the size and magnitude of the events that we're responding on are not getting smaller. and in some small way, I, I believe this builds capacity um, for us to respond to the very, the, the most important thing, which is just our next alarm. The very next alarm that comes into the, into the fire district um, for us to respond and do it with the greatest um, capacity that we possibly can have. Um, and so as I think about that, yes, it is a, a me one meeting a month, but we've been talking about collaboration all night. And so what's happened is this is not just one meeting uh, a month anymore. It's three board meetings uh, a month and you add in all of the other uh, community events. And so that's just through my lens. But I think the biggest piece to me was just hearing from the, the members that do attend our board meetings and uh, they're, I wouldn't say indifference. I think they're just all in support of a change. And uh, so, I'll leave it with that to allow you to uh, uh, discuss this at length as a board, but I think the other piece is just to look backwards at the last time that we did this in that uh, it required um, a two-step process, one that we engage in discussion about this, come back and uh, take action um, after that. And conveniently, we we're positioned to do a review of the board policy coming up. So if, if the board does so choose to make this adjustment, it will work perfectly with next month and reviewing the board policy and, and taking that action. So, Josh, would you speak to, and you might have already, and I missed it, to Alton Valleys? That was another question that came up. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I did not. Uh, so, on the onset of COVID, uh, Tualatin moved their, uh, their meeting time to three o'clock, and they have left it uh, since then. So, uh, they, they've adjusted. And I don't know all of the, the reasons behind that other than that was the impetus of, of that change. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions that, that you might have? Uh, yeah, just real quick, Marilyn, I'll give it to you. Um, just, I'll just start first. It doesn't matter to me. I'm okay with five o'clock, six o'clock, whatever. I'm fairly flexible here. So it doesn't, one day a month isn't gonna, it hurt me one way in either way so i'm i'm pretty simple that way marilyn uh, so chief yorkie i guess I, my question is um how did you re determine who to reach out to we reached out to attendees uh, of our regular board meetings and individuals that um uh, the board members have had uh, engagements with so 
that's that's how we determined that one of the discussions was do we use our our uh, social media platforms but the problem with doing that was uh it it wouldn't guarantee that we had our citizens and and it was also um, varying levels of how we could do that on the various platforms so it really pushed us back to a place where um, asking the people that do attend our meetings made the most sense and how many people was that were that i want to say it was a not many over seven but we also messaged this out um, and solicited feedback so we only got the feedback that we got. Yeah, so the issue with me, as I said before, I'm not actually opposed to this, but although despite your inference that I am, um, that it's a transparency issue for me. And, you know, as our agenda last month didn't even say what change we're going to make, just that we want to make a change. And uh, we have all of these platforms available to us. And I scoured them looking for just a little blip that says the board is considering changing their, their meeting time. Uh, if you have any comments, do whatever you want to do. And the only place I saw it was Thelma Hagen Miller's uh, letter to the her, her newsletter to the public saying that, that uh, we were considering it. And please contact Thomas Joseph if you have and eight comments to make. And I don't know how many comments uh, Thomas got. So, you know, um, it's, it's important to me that we maintain that accountability structure that Chief Brown has set up. And the number one item is who? The public, because the public is ultimately, they are at the top of the mountain and they need to make an informed decision. And if you're telling me that that was the best means of informing it, then okay, that's what you say. Um, Vis-a-vis Tualatin Valley, let me give you a clue. Never ever tell me that Tualatin Valley does something so I gotta do it. <laughs> Cause that is just not a sale point. <laughs> Mar Marilyn, that was a request. Own, they have their taxpayers. They, they're responsible to their taxpayers. I'm responsible to my taxpayers and they're not the same. And if they wanna go with the three o'clock, I don't care what they do. I can't tell them what to do, but they can't tell me what to do either. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, it's uh, engaging the public and being transparent are what board meetings are for. And uh, that's, that's my oar in the water on this. I don't care what time the meetings are because now I'm retired and so it doesn't make any difference to me when they are. But it does make a difference to me if we set a meeting time that has the effect, whether intended or not, of foreclosing the public from attending our meetings, whether by Zoom or otherwise. And I didn't see any resolution except, you know, now, now that the governor has said what she said, whatever it was, that um, we are now going to continue to Zoom. With, um, but I was with, uh, I fully support what um, President Cross said last meeting about, you know, having the hybrid method of doing it because you can reach more people that way, I think. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Oh, Chief Brown. Uh, thank you so much, Chief Yerke. Thank you so much for uh, presenting all that information. Um, and Marilyn, I just I just want to clarify just a small tidbit, just because you and I are on the same page. I, I just want you to want to articulate better. I love Tualatin Valley. I love them, but I, they don't dictate what we do here. At Clackamas Fire. It, it was a it was a point that was brought forward from the board about having us reach out to find out what time their board meetings were last board meeting. That's the only reason we were uh, sharing the time with you. Um, so thank you so much, Josh, uh, for, for sharing that info. And um, I, th I think there are more creative ways, Marilyn, uh, in the future. Uh, there's that new app that you had mentioned next door, which we do not have as one of our platforms that we are working on doing. Um, but uh, so much of our interaction is in that face-to-face and, and Rachel has the beautiful thing with Zoom is you're able to see uh, uh, attendees over the last, um, the last 18 months that we've been doing Zooms. Uh, and then Karen, in her meticulous way, kept a track record of, of people that, uh, that came to our board meetings pre. So those are the people that we reached out to were the people that were actually attending our meetings. Uh, yes, Chris. 
Well, I guess as, as I said last time, I, you know, having been involved for quite a while as a citizen before I decided to throw my hat in the ring and go play politics, I think it's probably one of the biggest complaints that I've heard from people is boards that have meetings at inconvenient times. And whether five is inconvenient or six, there's a certain thing that I guess that applies, whether it's people that come to the meeting or not, is just flat optics. Um, does it does it look like we're trying to be transparent? Does it look like we're trying to make it earlier so people can't attend? And I, I, it just concerns me um, because that is always a consideration. It, it's probably the most often heard complaint I've heard about public involvement from citizens is an inability to attend board meetings because it's made at a time when people are working or otherwise involved. And so it, it's difficult. I mean, I understand and I, you know, as much as anybody, I've, I've worked late and, and a lot of hours and, and all the stuff and I know what it entails. I'm just really concerned about the optics of how this is going to look to people um, of moving a meeting time. Now, this is in a few years, it's moved back two hours. Um, and will people understand the discussions we've had and everything that Josh has brought forward and all the, all the deeper information, or are they just going to look at it and think we're, we're trying to make it difficult for people to show up? So, I mean, it's, it's, it may not be necessarily a real problem as much as a perceived one. And I'm concerned about creating that perception or the opportunity for a perception in, in, in that respect. You know, I, I, I have to say with my, all my years working with the fire service that uh, there's two things that firefighters hate the worst. They hate change and they hate it when things remain the same. So um, it, uh, to some degree, it's a fear of change or a fear of doing things the same way. Um, I guess part of me says, uh, is there an opportunity here to try five o'clock and let's just say six months, let's just say we put this back on the agenda for February board meeting, or January board meeting, bring this topic back up and say, is five o'clock working? I think as our command staff goes out and, and uh, does their community thing um, and they get input and people say, hey, we don't like the fact that you're doing it at five o'clock, then they can report back to us in January, or February board meeting that says this isn't working, we'll go back to six o'clock. So I think there's an opportunity to try something new, but we don't necessarily have to, it's a time, it's, we're changing them by an hour. If we decide to bump it back to six o'clock for the February meeting, we can do that. So um, I just uh, I just wanna throw that out to you guys for conversation and see how you feel about uh, trying. Because once again, the other thing too, is our command staff is coming to us asking for a little bit of relief. You know, for them, I mean, I know it's transparency to the public, and I agree with you, Chris, if, if it doesn't matter to the public through, uh, because we are meeting their needs, then uh, maybe it does give a little relief to our command staff. But at the end of the day, if our public says, no, we don't like this, then we can return back to it. So I think, uh, I think we got to think with, with uh, both hats here. But anyway, Chris, what do you got, or Jim, or Thomas, I'm sorry, what do you got? Well, I, for, ever since I have been on the board, the most frequent attendees of the board meetings are the one I reached out. And I put my email and my phone number on her newsletter so people could respond. If anybody, when you talk about transparency, that's transparency. We put our name out there. If anybody want to call, I tell you, I talk to other county and city officials would not want to put their information because they are afraid they are getting bombarded with uh, messages of bad messages. And I was not, not worried about it. And also I reached out directly to those people who attended and they all said, we appreciate you asking us that is, that is an accountability. And if that matters to them, what else? I mean, maybe the perceived, now, Chris, perception is the reality. Maybe it's our perception. We think it's the reality. It may not be the public perception. So I, I'm with Jay and at least give it a six months and try if there is, if it doesn't, we can always go back. There is nothing stopping us from going back to six o'clock or seven o'clock, it doesn't matter.
Joe. Uh, personally, the five o'clock is fine for me personally, but I'm just one little old person. Uh, I would want to make sure with Chris and Jay that it worked for you for your work schedules. Uh, if, uh, if that's an issue, then I would have some concern about that. Uh, Chris brought up some good points about the public perception. I think those are valid. Um, in the end, I like Jay's suggestion also about trying it for a quarter. I don't, maybe six months is too long. I think if we, as long as it was okay with work schedules for everyone, then I would be willing to try it for a quarter, knowing that three months or four months from now that we're gonna actually talk about it again and maybe put it up for another vote so that we'd have that trigger point to have that discussion again. So I would be open for that. Uh, you know what, and on the other thing too, for me, Jim, thanks for bringing that up, but it would make my life a lot easier for sure if we did have the hybrid, because I would definitely be live as much as I possibly could. But in those cases where for whatever reason, I just couldn't make the one hour drive from my workplace to uh, station five, um, then uh, at that time of the day, at four, it, I'd have to leave here at four o'clock on a Monday to get to Clackamas. Um, and fight traffic down there on those days that that wasn't that isn't going to happen. Um, I, having the hybrid, being able to jump in on my iPad would be huge. So I think honestly, to get me to buy off on it, and I need to I need to have that option. So and then if I have that option, that means obviously the people in our community would too. So yes, Marilyn. I want to emphasize something that uh, Chief Yerke brought up that shouldn't be bypassed here, and that is that this is going to require a board policy manual amendment. And I don't know how you're going to say what's only the amendment's only good for six months or three months or whatever. So uh, you know, I, I I really don't know. But our, you know, we're going to have to amend the board policy because it specifically states in the board policy when the meeting is. And as he pointed out, it requires two meetings. You have to adopt it at one and then have it like a second hearing at the second one. And so if you only have it for six months, you've already eaten up a couple months of it. <laughs> And so I, I, like I said, I don't know how it would work. It may be the better part of Valor is to go ahead and pass it and then we can revisit the policy manual if need be. We just don't put a time in the policy manual. We just put it on the third Monday of the month. <laughs> just kidding, Marilyn, just kidding. <laughs> Nick, yes, Nick. Just a suggestion. Um, we. I'm, I'm open for whatever the, the board sees fit. Um, uh, if you try this thing for a year, you're going to have a good analysis. And then at that year time, we likely have some other things to update the board policy with as well. Um, it's, it's just an option out there is to try it for a year. If we start getting that, that negative feedback, then it's super, it's super easy to switch back. I don't see that we're going to get this. I don't think we're going to get negative feedback at all, but in the event we do, it's an easy transition back. The other piece to this, which is the blessing of COVID, I feel, is the fact of hybrid meetings and the fact that these are posted on our, uh, uh, on our, uh, uh, um, for the public to see. And, uh, you know, what I've noticed about doing these town hall meetings and these live Facebook events um, and these live county events as of late, you might not capture the people right then, but you do capture them at 10 o'clock at night or at 11 o'clock at night before they go to bed. And, and so uh, I think moving forward, this is going off on the time, time, but like Marilyn said, the hybrid model moving forward, I, I think is, is something that where we're gonna capture most citizens in Clackamas Fire, Fire District. Definitely the hybrid model makes me feel warm. Uh, I like that. I, that, make, that makes me warm up to it much better for five o'clock for all of the reasons that it, I think it does open it up for anybody that wants to show up in person or somebody wants to show up not in person. Um, so, uh, or show up from not even being in the state uh, at the time. So uh, I don't know, what do you guys think? I mean, I, I, I am really inclined to uh, do the five o'clock thing if we do have the hybrid op as part of our meeting. 
um, uh, I, I like that idea for a lot of reasons, but uh, without getting too, we've already talked it, talked it pretty deep here on a lot of things, but I, I do like it with the hybrid model. Yeah, Chris. Well, I, I mean, I guess, you know, sitting here, I, I realized Jim's, Jim's question about your and my time schedule sort of illustrates the point I'm making. I mean, I, I'm at a position in, in the world that I can decide I don't want to be there, so I won't be there, and I can leave my office when I decide I want to leave my office, which usually is about 15 minutes after I get there these days. Um, but not everyone has that option. So, I mean, yes, I can make a five o'clock work just because I can, I can go in an hour early uh, or not and just leave early. Um, in the winter, I normally run the crew until 4.30. So I, I'd have to take off early, but I can do that. But I guess my concern is how many other people that can't. And so I, I'm, I mean, I, I like the hybrid option. I, I, think, I think whatever we do, the hybrid option needs to be part of it just because people can see um but it's it, even if they're if they're watching it at 10 o'clock they can't participate they don't have that option to show up and say in the public comment section to talk about something um I, they'll be able to see the meeting but they wouldn't be able to participate and i, I that that is just a it's a real hard one for me because i just i i just really hesitate to do anything that makes it look or in any fashion could make it more difficult for the public to attend because at the bottom at, at the end of the day that's what we're doing we're doing the public's business here and that should be first and foremost in in what we look at well not to get too deep into the weeds but it is the whole idea of the uh, the board meetings are, are to conduct bus the business of the district with the command staff I mean, it is there. We we are fairly benevolent when it comes to a lot of uh, public entities that allow our audience to participate, probably more than other entities do. But uh, that's just our culture here. Um, but uh, the areas of participation for public are really those public forums that the the, the command staff has been doing, um, uh, reaching out to those communities. So um, I do agree with you, Chris. But I do agree with you that. Um, we do need to allow allow that time frame, but in the same token, even if somebody can just chime in by telephone and listen to them, listen to our board meetings, um, uh, there is not usually, unless we really have a hot topic like uh, mergers, consolidations, those kind of things, um, we don't get a whole lot of um, input at board meetings. Um, at least we have it traditionally. We get a lot of input, and that's not necessarily at board meetings. <laughs> so, um, well, I mean, you've been part of that too. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, what do you think, you guys? Um, are we willing to try five o'clock for a period of time, as long as they're hybrid? Well, we want hybrid anyway. It doesn't matter whether it's five o'clock or eight o'clock. We want hybrid anyway, right? Well, yes, but I would, I would uh, personally, uh, without the hybrid, I think the hybrid's kind of a, a stopper for me. If we didn't have the hybrid, I wouldn't be near as willing to go to five o'clock, just because it, I agree with Chris. We go to, we cut, we might cut some people off um, that we don't know that we cut them off. So, but uh, I think the hybrid's kind of a no. Uh, uh, we've already stated that that's that's kind of expected i think moving forward no matter what we do so, we're we willing to try it for a period of time six months a year what do you think jim what do you think well at first i heard four months and then six months and then a year but i think if we as long as it was a short time period i would be willing to support it if if all five of our time schedules worked then and we can make them work like chris said i think that's good but I would be willing to try it for that short time period. I think you said January 1st, well, that's four months. Hey, by then we'll probably know if we hear from citizens that wanted to go but couldn't. And uh, so I would be willing to. Well, there's a couple of things here. First of all, I'm, I don't think I'm ready for a year. 
I don't think I want to push it out to a year before we revisit it. I think that's one thing for me anyway. Um, and I just threw January out just as a number, but uh, it also kind of depends on when we start it. Um, if we start, do, if we chose to start it for the September meeting, or we can start it for the October meeting. But then, if, do we want to go six months after we start it, or do we want to go four, three months after we start it? I mean, I, I know you said something about quarterly. Marilyn had a good point though too about if it requires changing the policy manual, then you'd have to be changing it again, you know, within a couple of months if you wanted to change it back. So uh, well, it's one line. If that's a piece of paper. Sign it. That's fairly it's easy. One, it's one line in the book. We say we're going to change it back to six o'clock. Yeah. We show it at a couple of board meetings and we approve re re, re approve it. So. Um, I don't want to, I don't think we should make more of it than it really is. I mean, yeah, there's some formalities that we have to, have to jump through, but um, that's okay. That's an easy one. So right now uh, under the policy manual, though, this would, I think is going to count as the first meeting if it's adopted by the board. So the second meeting is going to be September. So we could not start it until October. Okay. Okay. Do we need to do this by vote or we can do this by consensus? I'm sorry, I don't technically know. So President Cross, what, what I have before me is just what we had in 2018. And it's exactly what Director Wall described was that it's a board policy adjustment and that the first step is review of the, the policy, which I think this suffices. And I actually think the previous meeting would as well. And then the second step is, is that edit. Okay, so I think, do we at least have a consensus to change the board policy manual to reflect a five o'clock meeting start time and a hybrid and hybrid uh, meeting uh, as part of that, where we have the teleconferencing and or life at the same time? If nobody's going to say no, I'm going to take that as a consensus. Jay, we just need to make sure that uh, right now we're, we should we we wouldn't be able to even do hybrid because of this governor's mandates. So, um, so we just need to keep that in mind. When, well, I mean, if we have to do teleconference, we have to do teleconference. Perfect. But that's okay. why I kind of put the and or in there. Like the, the and or that works. The teleconference live and or however however you want to wordsmith that, but teleconference and or live um, at five o'clock or seventeen hundred. Yes, Marilyn. Um, so okay, so I guess what we want is for section nine point three of the current board policy meeting to take to remove the six p.m. Met meeting time and add the 5 p.m. meeting stand. And down below where it refers to teleconferencing and our video canceling conferencing and meeting public meeting slots to also include as permitted by uh, applicable law uh, in person. So that's what we're talking about, right? Okay. So that probably requires a motion, I would think. Well, the no, motion not at this time, I don't think, no. because we're we had to have the discussion. What it says for amendment of a policy, adoption changes and additions and deletions or repeal, blah, 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 shall require a majority vote, two-step action separated by 28 days. Introduction, discussion, and deliberation is the first step that was here. Ratification vote is at the second meeting. So that's uh, Article Three of the policy manual. Well, no, there'd be nothing tonight. We would just instruct whoever's doing it. I guess Port Chief Yerke is stuck with this to um, send a draft amendment to nine point three to the board for consideration and voting next month. And and I'm happy to do that. No problem. And then uh, and then after that we can. Uh, when we, when we talk about the uh, approval of the board policy manual, then we can talk about again, um, 
how long we want it until we review it again if we want to push it back to february march april or if we want to do it sooner that to review and see how it's going so and hopefully by then if it, if my plan works out i won't be the president anymore of the board so i won't have to worry about it <laughs> so <laughs> somebody else can be in charge of the agenda then okay any more discussion on the uh meeting time change all right hearing none thank you for that i always enjoy these robust conversations with you guys these are wonderful um all right um hopefully this one will be much cleaner uh chief yerke will you talk to us about a four-year commitment for the uh civil service commission Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Yes, I believe we may have a layup here. Um, we're just requesting action uh, that we appoint the one civil service uh, commissioner applicant, Mr. Daly, uh, to fill the civil, civil service uh, commission vacancy that we have. Okay, do I hear a motion to approve Michael Daly to the uh, civil service commission for a four year term? I move to approve Dr. Michael Daly as the replacement on the Civil Service Commission Board. Uh, Appropriately. I second that. And Thomas Joseph seconds. Any any discussion? Okay, Marilyn, call the roll, please. Rachel. Not Marilyn, Rachel. Oh, I'm sorry. Marilyn. No problem. Chris, I got Marilyn I'm... on the brain. <laughs> Rachel, <laughs> call the roll. Chris Haas. Yes. Thomas Joseph. Yes. Marilyn Wall. Yes. Jim Searing. Yes. Jay Cross. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Daly. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you, and welcome aboard. And I don't know to say congratulations or condolences, but you got it. <laughs> so, Thanks again. <laughs> uh, um, and Chief Brown, or I guess it'll be Chief Yerke, you're going to help him get uh, uh, all the paperwork and everything he needs to get vectored into those meetings. Yes, we will do that. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Next thing is legislative updates. Genoa, what do you got for us tonight? Thank you very much. I wanted to bring you up to date on a bill that was signed by the governor, House Bill 2397. Brandon contacted me about this bill. Uh, it is one that prohibits local governments from assessing fees against residential care facilities. And there was some concern about whether or not fire districts would be able to continue to charge for lift services. I did my independent research with the caveat that I um, do not give legal opinions, but I did the, the research on the bill, um, passed it on to our legal counsel for verification um, and verified that the exemption and the caveat that's provided in the bill that exempts lift services is sufficient to allow fire districts to continue to bill for that service. And that would have had a huge impact on a number of fire districts. I, I, I don't know what it would have, you know, what the impact would have been on Clackamas, but uh, across the state, it would have had a huge impact. The second thing was the governor's mandate on the vaccination or testing mandate for healthcare officials. The day that came out, I contacted the governor's office to verify that EMS, EMT uh, personnel were included in the definition of healthcare professionals. I believe that they were because they are licensed under the health licensing. I'm sorry, under. Um, Oregon Health Authority. Thank you, Oregon Health Authority. I've got my acronyms mi mixed up. Um, they it took them six days to verify that and i i think it's because they were being bombarded with a lot of other questions about it and the cost etc it did come back that yes you are um there's just it, it doesn't appear logistically right now that that's a workable mandate because there's just not enough testing available um the chiefs had an emer the oregon fire chiefs association had an emergency meeting and i was called um immediately following that meeting, um, they wanted to know if uh, the fire district directors and the volunteers would perhaps sign on to a letter um, posing some compromises to the governor's office in light of the fact that this is logistically unworkable. The fire district directors met last Saturday and agreed to sign on to the letter suggesting some other compromises such as mask mandates or perhaps asking that there be a waiver for smaller districts 
um, that the um, that all forms of testing be available. So um, I wanted to bring that to your attention. The volunteers have not acted on it yet, but I anticipate that they will. So those are the two issues that have come up post session that I wanted to make sure you're aware of. And I also wanted to let you know how much I do appreciate working with Brandon. He's very sharp, and very quick, and thank you. Okay. Uh, Genoa, thank you for that report. Uh, any directors have questions for Genoa? Or comments? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Genoa. Thank you. Okay, next up. Uh, board liaison reports, committee and liaison reports, and it looks like I'm up first. I will have to apologize that I did leave my notes at home for the foundation meeting, although I was there. Um, and uh, one of the things I did want to report about the uh, foundation is the, uh, the benefit auction is a go. Right now it is a go. Uh, it's gonna be at Gray Gables Estate on April 23rd. They didn't give us a time, uh, but I'm guessing it's in the evening, similar to the way it was two years ago, but please put on your calendars, April 23rd, 2022, the uh, benefit auction at Gray Gables Estates on, I believe that is, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the road. Um, I can see Chestnut Drive. Chestnut Drive. Chestnut, that's it. That's it. But uh, you guys know where that is. So, other than that, it was a fairly short, about a 35 or 40 minute meeting, and they got a lot accomplished. And I learned a lot because I just kind of stepped in there for Dawn. And uh, so, I'm still trying to navigate my way through that, too. But uh, a lot of good folks there. Um, so, very appreciative of those folks. So, anyway, next up is. Um, Interagency committee, Director Joseph, just Director Searing, of anything that, uh, anything else that we haven't heard yet? We also had a, an interagency committee meeting with the city of Milwaukee. And uh, we, they are one of the few cities they want to continue to engage. They appreciate the cooperation with the district and uh, Jim and Nick Brown. You may have more update. Jim, anything else? It was a good meeting. Just uh, basically just updates between the two, uh, the, between the city and the district. And it was a great meeting. Always good to talk to their city councilors and their city manager. And it was a, just real good discussions, but nothing really in particular. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and then civil service liaison reports. Anything else that we need to know about? Uh, Commissioner uh, Chair Will Weatherly can't make the meeting tonight. He called me uh, this afternoon to let me know that he uh, wasn't going to be able to chime in, but uh, the Civil Service Commission did have their meeting on July 20th. <laughs> since we uh, appointed our liaison myself, this first go around, I was at that meeting and uh, did an update on behalf of the board and just district items. I think the intent was for the chair to chime into this meeting and say hi and just kind of go over uh, items to keep that communication open. But he couldn't make it tonight, but their meeting was a good meeting. Uh, I did a, an update. They spent some time in this, are continuing to spend some time on the chief examiner role, posting that to the outside and looking for someone to fill that role. They did a temporary assignment. They did some reclassification and just general regular civil service business, but it was a good meeting. And I'm really glad we're doing this to keep the communication open between the board and the commission. That's it. Okay. Any other uh, liaison reports that weren't on the agenda that we need to talk about? Okay, good. All right, board informational updates. Uh, I have a couple. Anybody else has one? Marilyn? Mute. Marilyn, unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. I was at the uh, Oak Grove virtually uh, CPO meeting and uh, Valerie Chapman, who is the vice chair, mentioned that she was the beneficiary of a uh, chipper grant 
from that's co-sponsored by the, the district and the um, and the foundation. And she was extremely grateful and expressed it to this group of which there were, I think at that time, still 28 people um, online. And um, a lot of people were interested in it and expressed um, uh, that they thought it was a good program. The only question that came up that I and no one seemed to have an answer to is that she, you know, they created all these chips with the chipper, which is what it's supposed to do. And then they were spreading them around like they were bark dust and they have this light bulb moment like, wow, we just chipped up all this fuel and now we're spreading it everywhere. So they picked it all back up and hauled it off to Metro. But I just wondered whether in part of the program we encourage people to dispose of the chippings somewhere else. <laughs> So, but other than that, it was very positive feedback. Okay. Very good. Okay. Doug, you unmuted yourself. Were you going to say something? Yeah, thank you, President Cross. Just to chime in there, Director Wall, with your co your comment, uh, we are encouraging the community members, whether they're grant recipients or just in general through uh, kind of the Ready, Set, Guy, Go program and defensible space to uh, make sure that they're not redistributing those flammables close to the house though to be fair uh, even if from the branch form down to a chipped up form it's definitely going to step in the right direction to be fair but yeah we're encouraging them uh, to store those uh, away from their structures or helms or whatever it may be uh, and director cross i did want to chime in something i just had to verify with rachel for the foundation auction that it actually is april 2nd not the 23rd Oh, well, thank you for correcting you me. Yep, no problem. I'm gonna have to change it on my calendar now. So, okay. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, thanks. Um, okay, next, thing, okay, and then I have a couple of things. Uh, OFDDA conference, I know I got this one right, Doug. Um, it's the uh, uh, 4th, 5th, and 6th of November. It's in the, um, uh, it's in Ashland uh, at the Ashland Hills Hotel. Um, we uh, kind of finished up the um, uh, a bunch of stuff on Saturday at the OFDDA meeting. Um, uh, so you should be, all the directors and uh, Chief Brown should be getting something here probably in the next week or so. Um, I don't know if Jenna was still out there, but uh, I know that we were working on this on, on Saturday. Uh, but um, if you want to do lodging, I actually, uh, talk to uh, Rachel today about uh, about lodging for that week because I have to go down I have to go down on the second we have a meeting on the third and then of course the Oregon Fire Chiefs Association's uh, golf tournament is going to be that then also the other thing too is this is the OFDDA is going to be doing a hybrid uh, a hybrid thing too I can actually send you guys out the uh, the actual draft of the uh, conference that I have if you want to see it although what I have is going to be changed before the final, uh, the final uh, um, uh, brochure uh, announcement that comes out um, for it. All, all the classes are locked in, but uh, there's some information in here about the golf tournament and some other stuff that's that's going on. If you guys are interested in seeing that before the official one comes out, but but Rachel does have the ability to uh, the lodging stuff is available. So if you guys want to go down to Ashland. For that conference she can uh, she can get your room uh it's all ready to go um on that uh any questions about the comp OFDDA conference at all okay the uh uh oh and uh, chief brian stewart's got a section in there that he's going to be speaking at too so uh our, our very own brian stewart will be down there for one day at least hopefully more but at least one day maybe come down a little early and play in the golf tournament um and then uh the uh, uh, the other thing too is just we talked a little bit of general talked a little bit about the testing stuff um, as part of my work I've been uh, very plugged in with what's going on with Multnomah County uh, and the testing the healthcare provider testing and I guess for right now uh, I've also been sharing a lot of the information with Heather and Nick so um, I think we all just need to kind of pump the brakes a little bit on this testing thing and see where this plays out Oregon Fire Chiefs Association. Uh, OFDDA, um, and of course, many of the hospital, the hospitals, um, Multnomah, certainly Multnomah County um, 
the health office, they're all very uh, plugged in behind the scenes of the challenges this testing thing comes. Uh, so uh, I think there's gonna be a lot more to come out before the end of September on this. So um, it's one of those standby to standby kind of the things when it comes to the testing stuff. And for Heather and Nick, I'll continue to uh, send you whatever I get from, certainly from Multnomah County um, and from Dr. Jew as well. So. Um, and that is all for uh, informational updates that I have. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. Um, all right, next up. Um, informational items from our divisions. Uh, it looks like Chief Brown, you're up first. Great, thank you members of the board. Um, just gonna give a quick, quick update and then turn some time over to Brandon. Uh, so give a quick update today on uh, health and safety section. Um, on uh, 7 8, Oregon OSHA adopted an emergency rule to protect employees from the hazards of high heat. And on 8 9, Oregon OSHA adopted a temporary rule to protect employees from wildland smoke. Each rule gave employee, employers about a week to have mandatory training for all personnel on this. So, the health and safety chief, uh, Heather Goodrich, has been busy diving into getting this mandatory training out and in, in, in implementation of of all the Oregon OSHA standards and mandates that have been uh, been thrown thrown our way in the last, uh, you know, let's call it 45 days. Um, also uh, dialing in the physicals for the recruits and, and issuing those, uh, fit testing. Um, uh, obviously with the changes with COVID, that has been occupying a lot of the uh, health and safety uh, divisions uh, time. Um, thought this was pretty cool that uh, we've had a couple agencies, uh, West Jackson and South Kitsap, uh, reach out to, um, to, to ask us about our health and safety program. Um, and uh, health and safety is uh, preparing for Auk Health for, uh, coming up. So uh, super busy in that division. Uh, appreciate all that, uh, that uh, Health and Safety Chief Goodrich is doing uh, for, for the members of Clackamas Fire. And at this point, uh, pass it over to uh, Brandon to talk about governmental affairs. Chief Paxson. Chief, thank you and uh, members of the board, good evening. Uh, just a, a few couple, uh, few updates from government affairs slash public information. Uh, in July, our focus was community town halls and engaging that conversation around wildfire. Still a lot of anxiety around that topic, as you could imagine with the uh, temperatures, the way they've been, the fuel moisture content, the way it's been. So uh, our staff, uh, led by Chief Brown, went out to three community fire stations, Eagle Creek, Beaver Creek, and Redland, to engage in a conversation around uh, the wildfire topic. So within that, we took a look and reviewed 2020 and the instance that occurred and, and kind of how that landed on our back door. We focused on the 2021 outlook and what we can expect through the rest of the season and then provided some additional resources uh, and updates around the additional resources that we have now, uh, namely Crew 30, the addition of a type three um, urban interface vehicle and the upstaffing of station 18, as well as uh, talked about ready, set, go with captain uh, Kerry Shanklin providing that information. So uh, they were really well attended. We had over a hundred people join us for all three of those um, or in total for those three events. Uh, the middle event, the Beaver Creek station was broadcasted. We had a videographer from Clackamas County come and it was on Clackco TV. It's the uh, public access TV program run by Clackamas County. So we were grateful to have them there. Really kind of was able to spread out that information amongst various folks who wouldn't uh, otherwise be able to attend any of the events. Uh, additionally, we joined the city of Happy Val Valley and their counselors to share the same updates and the same information regarding the wildland topic. And then Chief Brown visited the city of Milwaukee, uh, again, sharing that same conversation and some information around you know, fire district updates. Uh, it's been a busy time for us uh, in terms of emergency response and public information. Month of July brought 188 story hits. And so that's every time uh, we're inter interacting with the media throughout the month and it's covered within uh, the local media outlets. Uh, the most significant probably was the Highway 99E fire. It was about 10 acre brush fire that spread up over the bluff uh, and caused the level three evacuations up off of South End Road. So. Again, yet another opportunity to exercise the emergency evacuation system uh, partnered with Clackamas County and the Sheriff's Office. So on the heels of that, we really took the opportunity to meet with those two other groups um, to streamline our evacuation process and really what happens within the first two hours and who owns that and how that information is shared. 
so I think we've got some great steps moving forward to, to make that a great process. Uh, Genoa already covered, but we uh, had some discussions re regarding House Bill 2397, the impacts to our ordinance that we have in place, and she shared the details of that. And then uh, just one highlight, we rolled over 12,000 followers on Instagram. So I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to Tracy Grisham, who has been outstanding in, in kind of modifying and, and growing our social platform and, and helping our team get there. To put that in context, uh, our followership um, back in February of 2019 for Instagram was 2,299. And here we sit at 12,000. So it's a great way for us to engage the community, have, have good two-way dialogue in the online space. So um, that's it for me for the, the month of July. Um, any questions? Any uh, questions for Brandon? Thank you, Brandon. Strong work on that. I know it's a busy month. I know this month is turning out to be a pretty busy month as well. So be looking forward to your report next month. So, okay. Um, were um, with Heather, Heather, were you, did you have some comments? I see you on the agenda tonight. I spoke for, for Heather. She can, unless she has anything else to add. Okay. No, I don't. Brandon and I flip flop. People keep asking me, do you not have a voice? So yes, I'm here and I can answer any questions, but okay. Chief Brown took care of it for me. Thank you. Okay, good. well, part of the reason I was, once again, re-looking at the recipe of the month this month and so, that's another one I'm going to give to my wife. Let's see, see if she can pull that off. So, but thank you. Okay. Pictures. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, uh, uh, let's see, get my affairs. Uh, Chief Stewart, you're up next. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, and just like uh, Heather shared, uh, community server or strategic and business services kind of rotates our speakers to highlight their area as well. Uh, Without foresight and planning, uh, I managed to uh, select uh, Chief Yerke uh, to <laughs> present this evening. So uh, hopefully you haven't been tired of him yet because you'll get to hear him just a little bit more here in a minute. Uh, so the Office of Strategic and Business Services, uh, we've been busy this last month. Uh, I was out on a couple of fires, uh, connected uh, just every day with somebody back here working on uh, the business of the district. Uh, but a few of the things out there, uh, we spoke about IGAs earlier and just relationships between organizations. I uh, just wanted to share that uh, Chief Huffman and I met uh, the other day. We have conversations every now and again, but we happened to grab lunch uh, with the fire chief uh, when he was back in town during his vacation, uh, just to kind of catch up on where the fire marshal services and investigation fleet services have been doing. Uh, he's been very pleased with those services. Uh, he did mention uh, that uh, he, he uh, has appreciated the the distribution of work that we have, uh, but that's been a little bit of adjustment for his staff. Uh, things go off, new plans come in and, and then they come back and they've been reviewed. Uh, whereas maybe their former uh, fire marshal might take longer just from workload and everything else. We're able to get things turned around a little faster. Uh, and it sounds like Denny uh, Dahlgren who has been the primary fire inspector down there. has just been doing a fantastic job of building relationships uh, with his employees as well as the community. Uh, we have some other meetings going on, just talking about their staffing uh, and, and our ability to support them and uh, what the future may hold for uh, their organization and ours as we work to make sure that both of our communities are well protected. Uh, those conversations uh, just continue, and I think uh, I'm meeting with him tomorrow morning uh, just to kind of review that, and we're going to introduce him with uh, Mark Whitaker or tomorrow afternoon uh, just to help him expand his knowledge of our team. Uh, Director Hicks has also been working kind of across our partner agencies uh, with uh, the Fire Defense Board uh, and other dispatch centers. Uh, so last month, he secured the support from each of the fire agencies uh, to uh, help fund a second net motion server. Uh, so this one's in the cloud, and it really helps make sure that we have uh, kind of business continuity and flexibility in how we uh, work and where we can work from. Uh, so it's uh, fantastic that the other agencies were willing to uh, support those with uh, some dollars uh, from each of their uh, their general funds. Uh, he's also been working with uh, CECOM, LOCOM, and WACA. Uh, each of those agencies have a, a thing called a, a CAD replication server. And um, we've had issues with uh, that connection uh, going down, which causes some ESO and delays in reporting there. So he's been working with those agencies as well as Walton Valley Fire to 
uh, help make sure uh, that that gets supported and see what we can do about getting a, a secondary replication server or, or what kind of backup we might need for that. So that continuity is there as well. Uh, Brandon Paxton uh, jumped in on the community services piece uh, quite considerably. And I, I would say just generally uh, community services was looking forward to transitioning from uh, primarily a, a Zoom based and, and uh, distance based type of environment to uh, more public engagement uh, and whether it's smaller groups or larger events. Uh, and we have supported a couple of things, uh, but it looks like that window may be changing. And so uh, all the work that they've done certainly was not for uh, not, uh, but they've got more work to ahead of them in terms of how to adapt uh, to that new environment or that the returning environment. Uh, the fire marshal's office, a couple pieces from them. Uh, so they continue to work on streamlining their processes. And I'll just touch on their three major areas. So the inspections, uh, they continue to evaluate uh, the uh, types of occupancies and the frequency of inspections that each of those need and what type of occupancy or inspections uh, are, are required. Uh, so we are going to go back and revisit uh, and introduce the self-inspection model for those low risk occupancies, such as uh, insurance agents, offices, and um, and 7-Elevens. Um, we'll be re that next year. Uh, so they're working on that process. They've also worked on a process for online plan submittal. Uh, this is an intent to streamline pieces for, the, uh, for our uh, plan reviewers, as well as the developers and other building officials. Uh, they've been working with uh, each of the cities, uh, and now the uh, the county has uh, adopted a new plan uh, review process. So they're going to look at uh, which one they should be utilizing, uh, with the goal again of streamlining and making things efficient, not just for us but the other customers and partner agencies. They've also uh, now been being dispatched to first alarm fires, uh, kind of automatically. We used to have to request them, uh, or the incident commander had to request them on each fire that they wanted them on. They've now been requested uh, just as part of that dispatch, not on the task force or that limited assignment, but on the full first alarm assignment. Um, and that's been a, a positive uh, uh, outcome. Uh, it's been well received by both the investigators in terms of what they've been able to get from first two units, uh, the scene being more preserved by the time they get there. Um, and the ops chief is reporting that their crews are getting released uh, a little earlier. One of the things that you will see uh, looking at next month uh, would be uh, requested amendments to the um, cost recovery ordinance. Uh, we are looking at uh, some changes to our uh, costing uh, for self inspections, not if they're compliant the first time, but if we have to follow up on those, um, that we would be looking for some reimbursement for those costs, um, as well as the engineering um, expenses that we've been incurring, uh, looking to get those from uh, the developers as well. So we'll have a, a more robust conversation about that uh, either at a work session or at the uh, the next board meeting. And then the last couple of pieces, I'll just talk on support services. Uh, July was a busy month uh, internally with calls, internally with uh, needs uh, for EMS uh, support in terms of uh, fleet support. Uh, for example, fleet had, uh, we started the Hoodland and Sandy IGAs uh, it's a high uh, vacation month. We had conflagrations where they had to re, uh, work on and return units back to service after a series of conflagrations. Um, they were dealing with issues with vehicles with, from the high heat um, and fleet continued just to knock it out of the park. Um, needless to say, uh, we hired a new fleet tech for them based on the Sandy and Hoodland IGAs that started last week. Um, and while they did a fantastic job in July, I'm sure they're welcoming uh, Paul Eggleston with, uh, with a lot of relief and, and looking forward to uh, having that additional capacity. Um, and then logistics, uh, speaking on uh, another piece, as I've spent more time down at logistics over the last couple of months, uh, I've been really impressed to see uh, the engagement uh, with Deanne uh, in different component parts of our organization, whether it's operations um, or uh, the support services chief uh, or our emergency manager and making sure that our vehicles and our apparatus and the equipment that we have on them, uh, the radios to the hose um, are ready, not just for the day-to-day -day piece, but for surge requirements. Um, it's just been very impressive uh, to watch and see. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Josh Yerke and then I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of his report. 
Excellent. Thank you, Chief Stewart. All right. So out of human capital, I'd like to point out a few things. Uh, we have uh, posted the chief examiner's position, and that is open currently. We've gotten no interest thus far in that position. We additionally have a captain's test that was uh, reposted, and we currently have 10 applicants in that process. Uh, you may have noticed also uh, in the report that there was some uh, investigation into fraudulent unemployment claims, and uh, all individuals that were involved um, have been notified. And I think the important piece there is that none of our employees were uh, engaging in that fraudulent claim. Um, but that's something that's been going on right now and is an uptick uh, statewide. So anyways, they have been notified and, uh, um, and all of that has been dealt with. So I think that's pretty important. Uh, lastly, and what I'd like to leave you with in terms of human capital is just that we have had uh, a, a pretty trying month for our employees, uh, whether it's calls in uh, the regular duties of the job or their own personal um, uh, trials and challenges. And I guess the reason to share that is this, uh, we are a resilient group, a resilient uh, um, family. And what I witnessed was just a tremendous amount of rallying uh, behind each other and, and lifting each other up uh, to do the right thing and take care of each other so that we're ready to take care of the citizens when they're at their uh, greatest need. And we've had employees in the same position. So uh, I applaud everyone that stepped up and, and doing the right thing and just taking care of their uh, fellow family members. Um, but the thing that I noticed was just that we are an extremely resilient group and that is what's going to make the difference in uh, making a long, um, safe career to the end and, and, and being happy. So uh, I'm proud of everyone that I uh, worked with and through all of those things. And I'm just, uh, I'm happy, proud of this group for how we take care of each other. So I'll leave it with that. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jim, you go first. I've got a question as well. Um, hey, Brian, the, the data services report that Shelby normally does this part of your section that has all of the apparatus responses and mutual aid numbers and all that. I didn't see it anywhere this month. Was it all uh, missed? I was, since it was the first month that Estacada was independent, I was really super, super curious to look at the mutual aid numbers and I couldn't find it anywhere in the report. Uh, that's a great question, and I will have to uh, apologize because it's not in the current report. Uh, and Did I, anyone else notice that, that all the apparatus responses and calls and mutual aid numbers were all missing? Yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll have to look into that, Jim. I'm not, uh, I wasn't, I, I didn't catch that it was not present in the report, and I wasn't apprised of, of it not being there. Um, I, I will take a quick look unless you are, are certain that it's not in the operations section. Alternatively, yeah, and it's not in the operations section okay. either. Yeah, we'll make sure that that's uh, included with the next uh, board packet as well. So you have both July and then August. Oh, perfect. So, and the, the only thing I can think of, and and if it came across my desk, we did have the issue with ESO and that CAD replication server, which might have delayed some pieces. Um, and with me being out on the fires, I might have kind of just missed that piece. But we'll make sure we get it to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hey, Brian, I got another one, one other question for you on the cost recovery stuff that you're going to bring to the board next month. Yes, sir. Uh, is that uh, is that kind of consistent with uh, what other fire department and other fire districts are doing when it comes to their cost recovery programs? Uh, certainly, yeah. There's nothing uh, out of uh, outside of the norm that we would be looking at uh, and looking at uh, charging for uh, inspections. And, and we're really looking at just the self-inspection piece, and it's not an intent to... Um, charge people to do the self-inspection. It's um, to make sure that we're being compensated if after really two opportunities, they, they get the first notice, they get a second notice, and then we either have to follow up or go do the inspection, um, that we would be compensated for that piece. Um, the use of, uh, I guess, fees for inspections has been varies across the state. Um, Portland charges uh, just for every business inspection that they do um, for the first time out because there's a cost associated with it. Um, some charge for reinspection, such as we currently have, uh, I believe, for our second reinspect uh, in there. And this is just going to add on for the, uh, again, follow up on those self inspections would be the change. And then the fees for the um, 
the plan review uh, is very consistent. Uh, again, some places uh, are uh, charged for it, others don't. Um, many places capture that within their building department. Um, and so we're looking at the work that we've been doing for uh, quite a while uh, that we haven't been being compensated for. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, cool. Thank you. I look forward to seeing that next month or whenever you get it put together. So, perfect. Okay, uh, any other questions for, uh, for Brian? Okay. Um, capital support services. All right, we are down to financial services. Uh, Mark. Uh, good evening, uh, board members. Can everybody hear me all right? Good. Um, yeah, so just uh, a quick a quick update on on financial services. Um, you know, the, the most of the finance team has been busy with in addition to their regular duties uh, with with year end processing and trying to um, get all of the the year end activities um, invoices for requisitions, all of all of that complete. Um, you know, I will. You know, our, our tentative results are that we did we did come within within our budget on the expense side. It's it's very tight. Um, my current estimate is we spent about ninety nine point eight percent of our of our budgeted uh, general fund. Um, and on the opposite end, it uh, looks like we took in a little more revenue uh, than we had budgeted. Um, so both of those are are positive things and should result um, in at least a a minor increase in our in our fund balance. Um, when we adjust to to start the new fiscal year, um, a you know the other the other thing to look forward to at the next board meeting is is I'll potentially be coming forward. Um, I'll I'll complete a forecast of our cash situation for between now and and November um, to similar to last year. See if 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 the district um, may need to be prepared to borrow funds temporarily to to bridge any gap between um, between now and when tax revenues truly start to come in in November. Um, so I hope to have more information on, on that um, at, for, for the next the next board meeting. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I'll, I'll highlight is, is typically you would see in the board packet um, a, a board report um, from, from finance with a, with a monthly update and all the, the expenditures. And um, you'll notice that that's, that's not in there this week. And that's, that's one, that's, um, my fault, basically, I, I had intended to to instead put in um, some of our our estimates for how we ended uh, the year as of as of June thirtieth, but but wasn't able to get those complete in time. Just I don't feel familiar enough or confident enough in in the systems just yet to do that. Um, but then I also thought that um, you know just providing numbers for for July with one month of experience wouldn't wouldn't offer a lot as well. But I'm happy to send that that regular report out. Um, if that would be useful for, for folks. But but once again, I think with just that, that first month of data, I didn't see the, the relevance of it. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back next month with with more information on, on how we ended last year and how we're looking to to start this fiscal year as well. So um, I think that, that's all I have, unless there's any, any questions. Marilyn. Yeah, Mark, you can send me that uh, monthly thing because I uh, like to watch the progression over the over the month, even though it's only one month. So if you send that one, it's available, I appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions for Mark? Okay. Um, emergency services, Chief Santos or Chief Mueller? Uh, good evening, everyone. I just have one feel-good story I want to share, um, and that is that yesterday in Oregon City, Medic 316 and Truck 316 delivered twins. Um, they ran on a call, and uh, Ashley Hagee and Kristen Lynn were on Medic 316, Lieutenant John Wood, Sean Lahodney, Mike Hess, Dennis Kenny were on Truck 316, and they, uh, they responded on a woman who had kids at home, pregnant with twins, trying to get a hold of the mother-in-law, and uh, the mother-in-law was not answering the phone. So therefore, they had an imminent situation. So Chief Slater responded with them, and they delivered two healthy babies um, and transported them and delivered them pink, warm, and dry with Battalion Chief Burke Slater transporting, driving the buggy 
down to to the hospital with uh, with a pile of firefighters and the two medics, um, and uh, and to to only receive an an ovation from the emergency department and the labor and delivery. They, they had them wrapped up pink, warm and dry. They'd done a complete APGAR to make sure that they were healthy and they were alert. And they'd done a, a blood glucose and just left them nothing to do except for just uh, experience joy. So I just wanted to share that in light of everything that goes on every single day. And that's all I have to share today. Sounds like they didn't even need to go to the hospital. It was lovely. <laughs> okay, uh, Chief Mulek. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just have uh, some information to help uh, with uh, Jim Searing's question about some of the response data. That email did come to us, and for some reason, it didn't make the board packet. So um, I just on the July mutual aid uh, responses, I could almost put a exact call on these. We responded into Estacada four times, and they responded into Clackamas one time. Two of those, I believe, were water rescue calls where we have the, the county consortium that responds that, that direction um, already. So if you compare that uh, with looking at the numbers with Sandy Fire, uh, we responded uh, 54 times into Sandy uh, with 17 in return. I know that the Chief McKinnon and I had talked about just keep, how we keep that boundary identified between the two organizations so we can actually track those numbers and it seems like that's working great. Uh, just looking at the trends, um, and the comparison for the year with Sandy, I believe it's 259 to 107. So it's similar to the, to the same ratio um, as throughout the rest of the year. So I did forward that to Chief Stewart so he can uh, push that to uh, all the board members. Um, <clears throat> just a, there's a lot going on in operations. Um, and uh, just to kind of throw uh, just a couple uh, little bits at you that I want to get into uh, Crew 30. And just a quick report from Chief Olson, which I know everybody has a lot of interest in. Um, I took most of July off and come to find out that uh, that was one of the busiest fire months we've had in the year. There were, in a 30-day period, there were 21 fires that the uh, fire marshal's office was investigating. Uh, some of those were, uh, were pretty significant incidents. Um, in one of those incidents, uh, Chief uh, Kyle Olson on July 27th was incident command of a fire in Oak Lodge uh, where our crews at station three with engine 303, medic 303 conducted a rescue um, of, a, uh, of a resident inside the front door in a, in a building that was on fire inside an IDLH. Uh, you can reference his report in the, in the board packet. Uh, it's a pretty good narrative that Chief Olson wrote on that. Um, we have crews right now that are out on uh, conflagration uh, that are on the uh, Middle Fork complex uh, fire that is on Highway 58 out of Oak Ridge, which is 60 minutes east of Eugene. Um, we just found out about half an hour ago that they are gonna get uh, demo from that fire and push down to the Pat Meadow fire uh, in Lakeview. So it sounds like uh, the FEMA uh, has introduced funds into that. So it just kind of gives a state of where we're at in uh, as, as far as uh, the wildland response and in the state that our, uh, where our state is at right now. And just everybody's busy, our counties are taxed and um, I know that every county and neighboring county that we have is piecing together task forces. Um, so bear with me, I'm gonna read you an email. I had Chief Olson uh, just kind of give a narrative of Crew 30 and, and where they're at uh, and, and the work that they've done uh, just recently over the, since they started getting mobilized. So I'm just gonna read this to you. And there's a lot of fire names, all the complex names. So you'll just kind of get the gist of how busy they are and how they've moved around. So Chief Olson, he writes, uh, Crew 30 began last month with their first assignment on the Jack Fire in the Umqua National Forest. The Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office ordered the crew to assist in performing a primary, primarily structural protection assignment around the community of Dry Creek. This area is known for steep, rugged terrain intermixed with both primary residence and vacation properties. The crew, by all accounts from both state and federal partners, performed exceedingly well uh, with the crew putting in one shift lasting over 20 hours during a critical phase of the fire. The crew was demobilized from the Jack Fire assignment, and then on the same day was again ordered by the Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office to the Grandview Fire outside of Sisters, Oregon. The crew was assigned to eliminate fuels along a contingency line between the fire body and a large subdivision of homes in preparation of burning out this line if the fire threatened the area. The crew also anchored line on the southern edge of the fire to prevent further spread to the south towards the town of Sisters. Again, the crew received exemplary performance reviews from the state and federal partners. The crew completed its first full 14-day assignment 
finished on uh, this fire before returning to quarters for a mandatory 48 hours off. Almost immediately after completing the 48 hours, the crew was ordered by Oregon Department of Forestry to respond to the Elbow Creek fire near the town of uh, Wallowa, Oregon. The crew uh, completed seven tough assignment days before weather moved in and wetting rains assisted with the suppression efforts. On their way back from Elbow Creek, the crew had almost completed their journey home when yet again they were ordered by Oregon Department of Forestry to respond to the Skyline Complex uh, fires near Canyonville, Oregon. The crew was one of the first 20 person hand crews assigned to the fire and immediately assigned initial attack. Crew members directed bulldozer operations, dug direct hand line, and directed helicopter water drops to contain the Sweet Creek fire. Uh, one detailed crew member who has advanced training uh, was detailed off the crew to act at the incident as an incident commander of one of the, these three fires. At one point, having two bulldozers, four 20 person hand crews, three helicopters, and four wildland engines assigned to him. Uh, pretty incredible information here. So the crew's 14th day on assignment uh, was came due on the 9th of August and the crew elected to voluntarily extend their assignment by an additional seven days. They actually just got home today. Uh, it's a maximum time required before rest. Um, Brent's just saying how exceedingly proud he is. We have left just a tremendous impact within the state and the, and the federal at the federal level with, uh, with the impact on these fires. Just to wrap it up, Brent states that they have uh, almost 10,000 hours, man hours on incidents, 20 miles of hand line placed, 10 miles of hose plumbed and 100 miles hiked on incidents. So the second they got deployed, they have been nonstop until um, just a couple hours ago when they got home and turned around to go uh, Get, get the get the 48 hours rest and we'll see what happens in the future next. So um, I think it's just a great summary of, uh, of Chief Olson just putting together uh, just an outstanding program and it's being well utilized by the state. Oh, Chief, that is absolutely awesome. The one question I do have is how they hold up physically. I mean, that's, uh, I know they've been, I've been watching the pictures. I've been listening to some of the Gresham guys that have been working with them and uh, it sounds like they really, I mean, are they, how are they doing physically, honestly? Yeah, it's, it sounds like besides uh, the poison oak, um, I think everything is going, is going good and uh, pretty much par for the course for the, for a while. And there are, with, with that, with how the system is set up, there are people that are leaving and going to college and then we're replacing those individuals. So there's, there's a little bit of, uh, of just natural turnover and attrition in there, but um, it sounds like everybody's in, in good spirits um, and just absolutely loving it. So this is what they signed up for. And I'm glad that, uh, that they have work and uh, it's just a great overall experience. So okay. I'm a lot of moleskin and proud. taped ankles, I take it, but yeah. <laughs> okay. All yeah, right, any, uh, any uh, yes, Marilyn. Oh uh, yeah, um, Chief, what about Chief Olson? I see in his report, he's been on, on deployment for 23 state straight days. I mean, when's he getting any rest? So, so Chief Olson is, is off assignment right now. He, uh, he's, he's in town. Um, being a member of uh, incident management teams, they are either on assignment or they're up to be on the next assignment. So he's kind of living that right now with uh, Chief Shireman is another one of some of our other officers um, uh, on the line that are in that rotation. So uh, he's a multitasker. I think he's like Chief Stewart that gets a lot of work done when he's on assignment. Uh, so we haven't missed a beat on it at all. Uh, he's, uh, he's, it seems like you're home for a long, for short periods of time and gone for long periods of time. Um, but it's still, it is a season. And that's one of the things that he enjoys most is the wildland thing. So um, that's kind of the norm for the fire season. And, uh, and I got to give kudos to Brent uh, and Jonathan and all everybody that's gone out there as IMT members the feedback and, and Chief Brown could attest to this as well by getting a phone call from Mariana from, um, from the state that, that our organization has had a tremendous uh, positive impact on every fire that we've been on, anywhere from the first fire that they're on in Wasco County to um, the, the extension that just happened within an hour ago uh, to go down uh, to, to Southern Oregon. So um, I think it just speaks volumes of our organization, our people, and also the experience that they're getting and how they can apply it uh, in other parts of the state. 
And how does that affect our ability to respond here if we have those people that are all gone? Yeah, so that's that's a, a, a fair question. Uh, that is one thing that, that is a question that, uh, or discussion point that, that Chief Brown and I and Battalion 303 have, have quite often um, on what our balance is. And especially in the summertime with vacations and, um, and everybody's working, the heat, the fatigue, the call volume obviously is through the roof. And so we really balance that and look at, schedule out those two weeks and actually look on who's off and how we can fill that without creating more of a burden. So we're really looking at that balance, Marilyn. Um, and it's something that we adjust every day. Another part of it, part of that equation as well is that the request for our apparatus to go with them. And so when you, when you look at that, we look at what apparatus do we have to backfill and without leaving vacancies or void spaces in our FMZs. And so, um, so we, we look at the weather, all, all that before we make a decision. So it's constantly in flux. And uh, I feel right now that we kind of have a good system um, on how we evaluate that and we'll continue to evaluate it. And I just had, you know, for example, I had another one of our individuals that got requested to go out to another fire. So it's the same process that just starts over and you just ask the same questions. And so that's kind of how we're moving through it. And uh, I feel like our coverage has been good in the organization. Um, I feel that, uh, that, our, that, our, that our people are the ones that are out there, they love it, they wanna be out there. And so that level of excitement kind of creates that motivation to keep going. Dan, can I add something to that real quick? Yeah, you bet. Uh, and Director Wall, uh, I'm gonna give you a perfect example of, of what if we had an incident in district. Um, in Oregon City, when we had the, the Oregon City to the 99 fire, my phone rings and it's Brent, who's on the Grandview fire, calls me, says, do you need me to kick crew 30 loose and myself and start heading your way? Nope, you're good. So they are utilized in the state, but they can come back. They will they come back at a, at a moment's notice if needed. So uh, they, it's not like they are locked in at the state. They are very flexible if we have an incident within the organization to come back. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, we spent some considerable time talking about firefighter health, particularly mental health. And, you know, our people are not the kind of people that are going to just say, no, sorry, can't go, I don't think. And so I want to be sensitive, or I want you to be sensitive <laughs> to the, 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 um, the stresses that they undergo and that we don't overdo it in order to, to be good neighbors. So, yeah, it's, I, I totally agree. And we, we, we have an internal system of how it works with our line personnel on how they get deployed and the task force leaders working with the fire defense board on that rotation to kind of, to help kind of steer that direction. Um, and so there's, even though they're, they're gone for long periods of time, there's very few people that, that go on the long, the two week deployment and then get turned around like crew 30, they're kind of designed for that, that's what we want them to do. That's what they signed up for. So we have a system in place with fire defense board and internal systems to kind of help protect against that. Um, and we, we can talk, I believe wildland fire all, all night long, there's a lot going. I just wanna throw up, uh, out just one more bit of something that's a little closer to home. Uh, and, it, and it goes to speak of the resources that are available in the state right now is that there's a uh, complex fire that's burning on the Marion County line right now at sea. It's called the Bull Complex. Um, if you follow the Clackamas River all the way out to, towards uh, Detroit Lake, mm -hmm. you would run into that fire. And I believe there are instant command posts at the Ripplebrook uh, Ranger Station. That's a federal fire that they put orders in for days and never got resources. And they reached out to our organization and asked what we could actually provide to help. Uh, that's literally in our backyard where if uh, this and Nick and I got some information today that with concerns of the fire spread and if a wind event happened, that where that, that would actually go and that would come right back down our canyon. And so it has a direct effect on an impact on our organization um, and the communities that we protect. And so we put resources out there. I went through the same evaluation process and put resources out there on that fire. Um, and we have task force leaders, we have uh, uh, individuals that are running, uh, directing crews with heavy equipment and putting in roads. Um, we, uh, we have a type six, a small brush truck that's out there with the crew. So we're doing everything that we can, not just to protect the state, but to kind of protect the community around us as well. So um, just, it's just a busy season. 
it's a busy fire season and we're very well engaged in it. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Thank you. Any other questions for Chief Mueller or comments? That's a great report, Dan. Thank you so much for that. That's that's very encouraging. All that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Um, next up is um, local eleven fifty nine. Looks like we're going to hear from uh, Patrick. Are you out there? Uh, yes. The uh, video and audio working. Yeah, you're on. All right, well, uh, Mr. President, uh, Board of Directors, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you on behalf of Local 1159. Uh, first of all, just wanted to introduce myself because uh, this is my first opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I'm a captain at Station 15, uh, been with the organization since 2008 and have done a lot of work on behalf of the union uh, on uh, health insurance, health trust, uh, deferred comp programs, and then uh, just started working as an assistant steward uh, as of November of this past year. So uh, that's just a little bit about me. I uh, wanted to touch on, first of all, uh, an update on uh, the good things crews are doing or the, or the things crews are doing throughout the district. Uh, operationally, Chief Mulek already touched on uh, several of these. One was the uh, rescue fire in Oak Lodge uh, that uh, Chief Kyle Olson was uh, in command of. Uh, there also was another one, um, another fire in Oregon City that I wanted to touch on that was, uh, I believe, Clackamas River Drive in the Holcomb area. Uh, and the crews did a great job with uh, salvage, in the, salvage in this particular fire. It was, an, it was an attic fire over a shop, and it turned out the shop was uh, housing a uh, large, uh, uh, a bunch of classic cars and motorcycles. And I never heard an official accounting of what the value was, but I was told it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, classic cars and motorcycles. And was also told that the, uh, the family that owned, it was a, a Portland fire uh, family or related to a Portland firefighter. So they were, we got word back that they were very, very appreciative of the work that was done. And uh, we're pretty proud of our crews, uh, our crews at 15s. Uh, we now have up on the wall, a uh, picture of uh, one of the drivers in the station, uh, Jamin Lahodney, um, wheeling uh, one of the Harleys out in uh, full turnouts as carefully as he can. So we're proudly displaying that on the wall. Uh, in the station. So um, again, Chief Mulek and a couple of the others uh, before me already touched on this. It's been a very busy fire, a very busy summer in terms of fires. Uh, I'm hearing from crews, they've gone on more, they've had more shifts with multiple structure fires uh, this year than maybe ever in their career. Um, I, I appreciate the questions about uh, mental health with regard to this. Uh, although I would say largely with this, uh, going on fires like that, I think for for the vast majority ends up being a morale builder. Uh, the crews are experiencing a lot of, a lot of successes with getting uh, houses searched early on, with confining and extinguishing the fire early and, and salvaging a lot of property. And so the, there, there's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of morale building that comes with uh, being able to fulfill the promise of service that we give, seeing calls go so well and being able to make a difference. Um, so I would say busy in that regard ends up being a positive thing for us and a positive thing in terms of mental health. Um, Chief Mulek also touched on the, uh, the busy summer for uh, con flags. Uh, from a union perspective, it seems like there's an increasing number of crews that are getting interested in, in going on those. Uh, I think especially after last September, uh, a lot of people recognized uh, the value of gaining that experience, those skills, and really how applicable it can be. Uh, it, it made it feel much more applicable in our area and not just a problem that happens on the other side of the state. I know there's several uh, of the people that are really into wild, wild land that have been kind of banging that gong for a number of years, um, but it really, really hit home more, uh, more recently last year. So uh, I, I think that's been a positive opportunity for a lot of the union members as well. Uh, as, as far as, uh, so that's kind of the operational stuff that's going on. As far as non-operational stuff, there's a few things I wanted to touch on. Uh, one, I uh, wanted to share the, uh, the passing of retired uh, Lieutenant Carl Nisbet. Uh, Carl retired uh, about 10 years ago, and his son James now works for the fire district. Uh, he's at station three. Um, 
many of the members uh, stepped up to support James and the Nisbet family. Uh, and there's a couple we wanted to highlight in particular. Uh, one was uh, Alex Gillette, who's his uh, partner on Medic3. He was there with uh, James when he got the notification uh, and, and really became the main point of contact between James and everybody else for, uh, for what we could do to support James and support the, uh, the Nisbet family. Um, they helped him through the process. Uh, Alex also worked with uh, retired uh, Lieutenant Al Lori on helping to make arrangements uh, for the, uh, the service at Abundant Life Church. And uh, so, so we wanted to, in particular, thank uh, Alex, Gillette, and Al Lori for their uh, services in helping uh, James and the, and the Nisbet family through that. Uh, Clackamas Firefighters Flower Fund uh, supported four members uh, this month for life events. The Flower Fund acts as a benevolent fund in times of uh, joy and in times of sorrow. Um, local 1159 uh, firefighters support the fund with a $3 donation per month. Uh, it's managed by Nate Hahn and Andrew Gordian. Uh, and can be requested by members for a, a wide for range of uh, events, but that was utilized four times throughout the month. Uh, local 1159 uh, will be awarding three scholarships to three children of local 1159 members. Uh, these are graduating seniors. Two of them are from Clackamas and one from Lake Oswego. Uh, these scholarships are supported through the IFF Local 1159 Foundation. Uh, which is a 501c3 foundation uh, and supported through donations of, uh, of uh, and, and support from the members as well as uh, fundraising events and uh, sales from the local 1159 store. Uh, also uh, this month, uh, local 1159 executive board voted to approve uh, supporting Heather Goodrich and Alicia McVicker for hotel stays in New York for the IFF uh, Redmond Symposium. Uh, this symposium focuses on peer support, the IAFF Wellness Initiative, uh, peer fitness training and EMS. Uh, it, it's basically the Super Bowl for uh, wellness uh, and peer support. And uh, the Local 1159 uh, recognizes the services of uh, the wellness division in general and, and Heather and Alicia uh, in particular, what they've done. And we wanted to support them being able to go. Uh, attend that, uh, but it turns out it was canceled due to COVID. Uh, so they won't actually be uh, attending. So um, also wanted to congratulate a couple members on uh, recent marriages. Matt Towner at Station 5, uh, who was married on July 17th to Ali um, McEwen. And congratulations to Austin Amaya at Station 1 uh, and his wife, uh, Adriana Amaya Baldwin. Uh, they were married last year, but due to COVID, we're not able to celebrate with friends and family. So they were finally able to do that. Uh, also wanted to give an update on uh, mental health and physical health uh, of everyone right now with all that's going on, heat, middle of the summer. Um, that's one of the questions I was forwarded uh, that, uh, that it sounded like you as the board wanted to hear about uh, in particular. Uh, in terms of physical fitness, uh, from everything I've seen and heard, crews seem to be held, uh, holding up really well uh, with the heat, the challenges, the summer, and the heavy uh, call volume. Um, I, I could speak just from personal experience. From what I've, I, I joined the organization in 2008, and I can tell you that the nutrition habits and the physical fitness habits and the general wellness happens habits have significantly improved um, from what I saw when I joined in 2008. Uh, and, and I think that having better nutrition, better physical fitness uh, is in no small part due to the work of the wellness division. And, and I think that really pays heavy dividends in seasons like this um, in, in, the, in the heavy workload and in the summer heat. So physically, I think crews have held up really well, uh, largely as a result of that. Uh, in terms of in terms of mental health, I would say there, I, I gave the one positive, which is that I actually think the kind of the, the heavier call volume of fires and some of the um, uh, some of the more acute calls we've gone, I think can actually be a morale builder. In terms of challenges to mental health, uh, there's really two that stand out uh, from the union perspective right now. Uh, the first one is COVID fatigue, and I think that that's really the biggest one. Uh, we all know the situation's dynamic, um, but it, there's seemingly constant changes uh, uh, in the policies and directives coming out at the state level and from OSHA. 
And just that level of uh, change and instability uh, really causes a lot of, uh, I think, mental health challenges and a lot of stress. So that I would say is the is the biggest one. And and then the other policy, the, the other point with that would be, it it seems like a lot of the policies coming down don't necessarily fit the uh, firefighter work environment, fire service work environment all that well. It seems like we're a little bit of a square peg in a round hole with some of these policies. And so it becomes a real challenge in terms of stress and mental health when when you get down to the details of implementing these policies, it just clearly doesn't seem to make sense at a detail level on some of them. Um, but, but clearly we are, the decision makers within the organization are trying to do the best they can given the directives. Um, but, but sometimes even with the best they can, it seems like it's a, it, it's a challenge to make common sense policies with what's coming down. So that's a, that I would say is the biggest challenge to mental health. Um, the other one is uh, the contract. So uh, I know the bargaining teams for both labor and management have been working diligently to come up with an agreement, to come to an agreement. But um, for the crews on a day-to-day -day basis that aren't involved with the process, it is the instability of not having the contract in place uh, is a big uh, stressor as well. It is, that is also, I, I would say that's the second big challenge in, term of, in terms of mental health now. So uh, that's everything I have. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Any questions for uh, Patrick? Paul? All right. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for uh, stepping up and coming up to the board meeting, presenting for the local. Appreciate that. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. All right, next up is Volunteer Services. Looks like Chief Dieters. Uh, good evening, thank you, uh, members of the board. Uh, my report, uh, just a few things to highlight. The training for the group for the month was uh, radio communications and there were some simulations and then uh, some hose, hose load work. And then EMS was case reviews with Dr. Turner. And then the rehab group also uh, did a support drill at a classroom drill. Uh, still, the explorers aren't back yet, so nothing to report for them. And then the, the station coverage, station 12 was 31 nights out of 31. Station 13 was 20 out of 31. Station 21 was 19 out of 31. And then the rehab water tender group did it 11 from home out of 31. And then you can see there is a number of personnel changes. Uh, July was the hiring season uh, all around us. So you can see there is one typo there, uh, volunteer EMT. Uh, Dan Marting is, is also a paramedic. Uh, I missed that one, but uh, all of those paramedics were hired. You can see the agencies that they were hired at, Columbia River, Longview, Lake Oswego for two of them, and then Mid-Columbia, and then one did resign. And then uh, my training report is in the board packet. I'm doing those, those two jobs, so I'm down here in the lobby of training, if you don't recognize my background. And um, tonight, for the volunteers, it's going to be the Vice President uh, Connor Stewart that will be presenting. So I'm happy to answer any questions for you. So you set your office up in the foyer there at Training Center? Is that what I'm saying? I did. Uh, Nick uh, won't give me an office. He said, until I work harder and talk less, I can't come to, to an office. So I'm in the lobby. 21st well, floor, you're... bro. <laughs> well, at least you're not out in the training tower, I guess. I think that's something. Yeah, the reception's not very good. I tried that first, so I had to come inside. <laughs> All right. Any uh, any other questions or comments for Steve? Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay. It looks like Connor, Connor Stewart, you're going to be uh, talking for the Volunteer Association tonight. Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and uh, members of the board. Uh, since this is my first meeting in this capacity, um, and you'll probably be seeing me a little bit more um, off and on with uh, me filling in for Kirk when he's busy. Um, I'll start with a quick introduction. Um, my name is Connor, uh, Connor Stewart, and I am uh, the vice president on the association board. Um, just started that position in July, but I've been on the board for a uh, year now. And then I'm also a volunteer suppression firefighter here at Clackamas, um, and I've been here for about three years now. Uh, and then as far as the association concerned, um, there's not much on my end to report. Uh, the only items that I have to report to you guys 
um, are that our account with the Clackamas County Bank has been officially closed and all our funds are now in our new Chase Bank account. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're working with the training department on um, training some of our senior members to prepare them to assist uh, with the Volunteer Recruit Academy this fall. Uh, we're really excited about this process. We love being involved with it. Um, I think it's good for both the senior members to kind of hone in on their skills. Um, and it's nice to have those recruits get to know those members because they'll be working with them in the field. Um, so that's about all I have for tonight. I appreciate you guys having me. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions for Connor? Are we, uh, are we gonna have a, a live academy for the volunteers or are we gonna have a, uh, a virtual academy for the volunteers this time? I'll pass that question to, to Chief Dieters. I'm not really sure too much on that one yet. Yeah, but we're, we're planning for in-person uh, so far. So far it's in-person. All right. Um, yeah, that's a struggle with everything that, so. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Connor, and welcome. Um, any, uh, anything else, uh, correspondence, since up, anybody have any anything about the correspondence that was in our, uh, our packet? A few, a few uh, nice notes in there this time. Um, okay. So our next meeting, I believe, is the 20th of September um, at uh, six o'clock still, uh, until we approve that. And uh, it's probably right here, same bat time, same bat place, right here on uh, teleconferencing. Um, the uh, So for the board members, um, and I believe for uh, maybe a couple of the chief officers, we're gonna have any, we're gonna recess this uh, regular board meeting. We're gonna recess to a, uh, uh, an executive meeting. Um, hopefully that won't take very long and then we'll come back um, uh, to the, uh, to this meeting to uh, talk about whatever and then, it, then adjourn. So uh, without further ado, um, we will recess this meeting this regular board meeting at 8.46. And uh, Chief Brown, who's gonna be at the executive session? You and Chief Stewart? Uh, uh, just myself, because it's just an update at this point. So an update. yeah, I, I'm just I'm just gonna give you a quick quick update, two, three minutes. Okay. Unless there's questions. Okay, so has everybody got the link? I wanna make sure before we leave here, everybody's got the link to the executive session. Chris is shaking his head. Um, Rachel, can we make sure that Chris has the link for the yes. executive session? Absolutely. I'll send that to you right now, Chris, or Director Haas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has it? The board, the board. Oh, yeah, Michael, this is just for the, this is just for the directors. This is just for the directors and uh, Chief Pro. So, okay. We'll see you on the other regular board at 9.01 p.m. Um, we had an executive session, a quick briefing um, from uh, the fire chief on the status of the labor negotiations. There were no decisions made. And, we were, and so now, uh, unless the directors, any of the other directors or anybody else have any comments, we will be um, adjourning the regular board meeting at 9.02 p.m. All right, thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.